Hey everyone, and welcome back to another compilation episode series here on The Completionist. Uh, I obviously don't have a new episode out uh, because I am working on a new TV show that I am producing and co-creating called God of Work. It is a sketch series show about uh, video game characters in an office setting, and uh, I play Kratos. Surprise, surprise. Yes, I did shave my head in honor of Preserved Play for charity. We raised all that money, so thank you to everyone. You actually helped me with my job, so thank you. Uh, we're here. We're on day three, I think, of, of day four of, of many to come. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm making the show with my, my co-producer, creator, Emily, and all these great people uh, putting their blood, sweat, and tears. There's some of them right now getting ready to shoot an outside scene. So yeah, uh, in honor of the show, uh, I have a teaser trailer for you guys. If you haven't seen it already, it's going to play. And then I also have, just because, hey, it's God of War. Hopefully you all like it. Uh, I'm going to show you guys every single episode of The Completionist in which I completed a God of War title. Now, I've done all of them except one. So there's going to be one missing from this because I haven't done it yet. But with that said, enjoy the episode. I'll see you guys soon. I have been a great many things in my life. A killer. A god. An emotionally distant father. These roles have made me who I am today and have prepared me for my greatest challenge yet. Yeah! Oh! Kratos, so sorry to bother you. Uh, just a little bit of a problem. We are out of toner in Copier 2, and Scorpion and Chun-Li are sparring over who gets to print first. In a moment. Okay. I have business with the Oracle. Sorry, sorry, okay. Thank you. As I was saying, this is going to be my greatest challenge oh, yet. Okay, okay. Oh. Now uh, the King of Fighters crew just showed up and uh, it's getting really weird out there. How weird? Like, like fighting game weird. <sighs> Never send a boy to do a God's job. In New Game Plus, my goal has always been to revisit the best versions of the games I have already completed. However, this isn't always possible. Some games have never been updated, like ActRaiser or The Bachelor. Then there are some games which I've already completed the best versions of. This is true of today's game, God of War. It's no secret that God of War on the PS4 was one of my favorite games of last year. It took the series in a completely new and more emotionally mature direction. But with that said, we can't forget about the original God of War. This series has become one of my favorites and I have done just about everything there is to do in a God of War game. Is that going to make revisiting this game seem stale? Let's find out when I recomplete God of War. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Completionist New Game Plus, where I am recompleting the first 120 games I ever featured here on my channel. A big thank you to our sponsor for today's video, Era of Chaos. More on that later in today's episode. Now, it's no secret that God of War on the PS4 was one of my favorite games of last year. It took this series in a completely new and more emotionally mature direction. But of course, we cannot forget about the original God of War on PS2. You know the one I'm talking about. Instead of lecturing his son, Kratos would scream at a moment's notice and rip off the heads of his enemies. That one. That's the one we're going to talk about today. So when I first completed God of War back in 2012, I went in totally blind. I had never played a God of War game before, and I did not know what to expect. And boy, have things changed. I have now completed almost every single God of War game in the series, and I've loved every single one of them. The vicious gameplay, the epic music, and the gorgeous graphics make for an amazing action experience. But the best part of the whole series has got to be the main character, Kratos. He's easily the most badass Mediterranean protagonist in any media ever. Take that, Heracles! Or as many properties incorrectly refer to him, Hercules. 
Do your homework, Hollywood. Having seen where Kratos ended up with the most recent God of War game, I was excited to go back to it, where his journey first started. Kratos was once a captain in the Spartan army. When his men were about to be defeated, Kratos asked Ares, the God of War, to save them and give him the strength to defeat his enemies. Ares obliged, but in exchange, Kratos now had to serve Ares as his servant. One day, in order to make Kratos a better warrior, Ares tricked Kratos into murdering his wife and child. But instead of making him a better warrior, it angered Kratos, and he renounced his servitude to Ares, swearing to get his revenge. Yo, man, this is up there with the darkest video game backstories of all time. It also makes it much easier to sympathize with Kratos. As opposed to just being a murderous brute, he is a man driven to violent insanity by thoughts of revenge and nightmares of his family that he was tricked into slaughtering. This violent insanity is perfectly shown in the hack and slash gameplay. This is classic PS2 era mature violence with tons of limbs and heads ripped off with the aid of quick time events. Now this game helped define what action games would be for a long time. Just one man slashing through dozens of enemies with ease. Not that this game is easy. It is incredibly difficult to actually kill a god. And that is reflected in the difficulty of the game itself. Now this game was tough, but it felt rewarding to go through it for all three playthroughs that I had to do. I had to give it a complete it. But could that happen again? See, I'm recompleting the version of God of War that's in the collection on PS3, just like I did all those years ago. A lot of things have changed for me since then, including the introduction of the newest God of War, which featured some of the best combat I've seen in years. It could feel completely stale practicing being a God Slayer once more. Or maybe I could just become a God with no effort at all. When you have played a game so many times, it is easy to think that there is nothing else in that game that can surprise you. But when you find a thing that does, it not only makes a game a completely new experience, but it makes the original way of playing feel new again. God of War is all about one man's journey to kill a god. Fortunately, you are given many tools to do this. The Blades of Chaos, the Trident of Poseidon, even Medusa's head. But the most powerful tool that I found was not actually a part of the game at all. It was a glitch shown to me by my Twitch audience. A Twitch glitch, if you will. Early on in the game, there's an area where you obtain Medusa's head. When you get the Medusa head, you are given a little challenge room to showcase how to use it, and the game gives you unlimited magic. However, if you leveled yourself up properly, you have the ability to jump above the door that's locking you out from continuing in the game. Normally, you'd have to murder everyone to open that door, and your infinite magic goes away. But if you keep launching yourself above that that door high enough, eventually you'll just go over that door and suddenly you'll have infinite magic for the entirety of the game. Normally, I'd be talking about hacking and slashing my way through waves of enemies with the Blades of Chaos or the other weapons you unlock, but I had no need to. Instead, I just kept using spells to keep the enemies at bay. I would use Zeus's Fury to attack enemies from afar with lightning bolts, and as soon as they got close, BAM! hit him with Poseidon's rage. Normally, I'd find this as a reason to complain about the game, but this was so much damn fun. I was all powerful and could destroy any enemy without having to break a sweat. Gorgons, zap, you're gone. Centaurs, bye-bye, you're dead. Undead legionnaires, oh, no, 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 you're gone now. I became so powerful that I actually completed this game in two playthroughs instead of three I had to do the first time around. Now, in order to truly complete this game, you have to beat the game multiple times. You need to beat the game to unlock the hardest difficulty, God Mode, and you need to beat the whole game in under five hours to earn the speed of Jason McDonald Trophy. Well, with this glitch, it allowed me to beat God Mode and get the timed trophy at the same time. Now, originally, I got the Jason McDonald Trophy set just by setting the game on easy and using one of the unlockable costumes. Now, that isn't even necessary anymore. This glitch changed everything and made my revisit faster and more fun. But if I had to do this another time, I feel like it would have finally started to become monotonous and repetitive. Upgrading yourself feels almost unnecessary. Even though my magic was essentially endless, I still had to collect all the phoenix feathers to upgrade my meter. Despite the fact that no one ever really got close enough to me to touch me, I still had to find a look organized to get my health to be bigger. These items still feel important and great to collect because it just reiterates the fact that yes, not only is my character progressing with the health and magic meter upgrades, but I am a god, which means my meters are always full and large. Collecting the red orbs from dead enemies and chests is still useful for upgrading my weapons and magic, only furthering this narrative that I am the god before I even defeated the god of war. But I have to be careful. Unlimited power is exciting at first, but it can get very boring very fast. That's why the gods of Mount Olympus meddled in the affairs of man so much. They were bored.
Fortunately for us, there's the challenge of the gods. Once you beat the game, you'll unlock these 10 difficult challenges that usually involve killing specific enemies before a time limit runs out. This would be a breeze to my new final limited magical abilities, but there is no Twitch glitch for me to use in this mode, so I had to do it the old fashioned way. Going from an almighty magical force to a mere mortal was daunting, but it was awesome. Because of the massive change from bottomless magic to limited magic, it actually became even more fun than when I first did it. The challenge changed from something I had to do to complete the game to a challenge I had to do to prove that I was worthy of being a god. And I haven't had that gaming experience anywhere else. Completing all these challenges results in getting unlockable costumes that are useful and hilarious. My favorite one is Dairy Bastard, where you are dressed as a cow, but the ability of unlimited magic is kind of useless once you've already reached your magic potential. I was worried that revisiting God of War on the PS2 would be boring because I have played so many of the games in the series at this point, but because of a few of my helpful Twitch followers on my channel, I was able to experience this game in a completely new way. It actually made me feel like a god. Wait a minute. I literally had some followers go to a place dedicated to me, and their words gave me immense power to defeat all of my enemies. That means I am literally a god. I am the completionist, god of destroying games. All bow before me. Dude, dude, calm down. What? Gerard, you're not a god. You just like video games. That's it. It's okay. Yeah, sorry. I guess I let all this game power stuff go to my head. All that machismo can do a lot to you, you know? When it comes to completing God of War, it's pretty obvious what's at stake here. Get all the trophies, beat the game on the hardest setting, clear all the battle challenges, all that stuff. The nice thing is that all of it is pretty straightforward, so it's not too complicated as long as you just keep focusing on doing what's best for you. Originally when I completed this game, one of the biggest things for me that made the whole experience worth it was the God of War phone number rewards at the end of the game. And I still believe that those two phone numbers are the reasons why this is one of the best games to complete. The first phone number you find at the end of the game on your first playthrough. You have to destroy both of those statues at the end of the throne room. Don't sit in the throne room until you've destroyed both statues. Once you've done that, you've got a cryptic phone number that plays out in front of you. When you call that phone number, it goes to an automated machine in which Kratos congratulates you for finding this Easter egg and playing his game. Hilarity ensues. Now the second phone number, which I find to be more important and more rewarding, is the one you get for completing the game on the hardest setting, God mode. In this instance, Kratos congratulates you and praises you in all of your awesome glory and abilities for getting this far. And of course, from there, we have a plethora of cool and fun costumes to enjoy on multiple playthroughs for the years to come. One of the more fascinating things about the internet in the most recent years is how much these conversations just kind of keep happening online. And when it comes to God of War, there was something that happened a few years ago which is kind of funny. In 2017, Elon Musk tweeted out his phone number online. People made fun of him, but they didn't realize the number he tweeted out was just one of these phone numbers from the God of War Easter egg. So bravo, Elon Musk for getting all those weird clickbait articles written about you. While these phone numbers aren't anything you can't find online, the process of completing God of War is still absolutely worth it. Whether I'm playing this as a god or as a god slayer, it is still just as much fun as when I completed this game the first time around. When I recompleted God of War 1 for the PS3 collection, there were two playthroughs, which was one less than last time, eight deaths total, which was a lot less than before, 18 Gorgonais and Phoenix Feathers collected. But because I did two playthroughs, double those amounts. 10 challenges completed without the aid of unlimited magic. This was still difficult, but it was still a great time. 36 trophies unlocked, which are still relatively simple if you just pay attention to the game, what's going on. Seven and a half hours of total play time, which is less than a third from the first time I completed it. And one man, one man who truly became a god to complete this game. Me, I was that man. You're not a god, man. You're just a guy that likes video games. That's it. I loved the original God of War the first time I played it, but getting to revisit the game with unlimited game breaking magic made the game completely new for me. I still felt like a badass, but for a completely different set of reasons. It honestly made me wish that every game I revisited had some kind of infinite power that I could just use and abuse. And even without the infinite magic, this game is still incredibly awesome. If you don't want to exploit the glitches in the game, it is absolutely still worth playing till this very day. God of War is one of the best games from the PS2 era for a reason. So with that in mind guys, I still get this game my completionist rating of complete it. Complete it, Ares!
Yes! Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Completionist. I know it looks stupid, but go with it. In the early days of the show, I sat myself down and I played God of War, and I was blown away at how incredible the game was. I haven't gotten a rush like that from a game I hadn't played in years. Well, last year around this exact same time, I took a two month break, and during my break, I completed almost every single God of War game in a few weeks sitting. Prior to that, I had only put the first one for the show. So today, we're gonna catch up with our old good friend Kratos, the God of War. The original God of War was a critical and financial hit that put its developer, Santa Monica Studios, right on the map. See? Right there. That's them right there. That's also a map. It was so popular that the game went on to become one of the PS2's flagship titles, with many considering it as the defining symbol of the console itself. A follow-up to this massive hit was inevitable, and when Corey Barlog, the game director of God of War 2, set out to create the sequel, he prioritized the few areas in which the original game was criticized for. By expanding on the previous game's story, making sure that the game's most epic moments occurred within actual gameplay, and providing richer puzzles and more boss fights, God of War 2 ensured that it would be met with just as much praise as its predecessor. But it's been a few years since God of War 2's release in 2007, so it just might be the right time to re-examine the title that was known as the swan song of the PS2 era. And with the PS4 port of God of War 3 around the corner, and all the other God of War packs out there on PS3, there's never been a better time to now get invested in the story of Kratos and his thirst for vengeance. Do you see, gods of Olympus? Do you need more proof than this? So, I don't recommend playing God of War 2 without playing the first one. And I can't stress that enough in this type of game. The game picks up where it last left off. Kind of. If you forget that God of War Ghost of Sparta happened. So click the link on the screen right now if you want to check out our review of God of War 1 to get you up to speed. Otherwise, you're going to get very lost in what I'm about to unveil. Having killed and replaced the previous God of War Ares, Kratos is sitting pretty on his throne. Really pretty. But apparently, Kratos still isn't free of the nightmares that the gods promised to relieve him of. So he's been taking his anger out on the world of mortals by commanding his Spartan soldiers to conquer and destroy whatever city he points them at, which today happens to be the city of Rhodes. Kratos' old pal Athena shows up and warns him that he is not too popular with the rest of the gods in Olympus, and that they won't stand for his belly aching much longer. These gods seem to have a lot more drama between them than the teenagers of Beverly Hills 90210. But Kratos ignores Athena's advice and decides to drop it on the city of Rhodes and crash the party himself. Scandalous! But just as Kratos begins breaking everything in sight, a mysterious eagle swoops down from the sky, shrinks Kratos back down to his fun-sized human self, and brings the Colossus of Rhodes to life. Kratos makes his way through the war-torn city with the giant mannequin stalking him every step of the way. Finally confronting the Colossus, Kratos is offered the Blade of Olympus by Zeus himself in order to aid him in the battle. But in order to power the blade, Kratos is going to have to dump all of his godly strength into it. After Metroiding himself multiple times and making himself mortal once again, Kratos is able to wield the blade and slay the Colossus. But because Kratos is too busy gloating in victory, he doesn't notice the huge hand falling right on top of him, which crushes him and leaves him helpless as a kitten. It's then when Zeus appears and reveals that he was the mysterious eagle all along. Zeus offers Kratos one final chance to swear loyalty to the gods, but when he refuses, Zeus runs Kratos through the Blade of Olympus. Oh, and just to be a dick, he also completely annihilates Kratos' Spartan army in the blink of an eye. As Kratos is dragged down to hell, he hears the voice of Gaia, the titan spirit of the earth. Er, mother of the earth. She gives our crestfallen hero a much needed pep talk, heals his wounds, and convinces him to resume his quest to kill Zeus. Once Kratos climbs his way out of the pit, Gaia explains that the only way he'll be able to bring down Zeus is to travel back in time and strike him down at the moment he betrayed Kratos. 
The problem is, time travel is the territory of the Sisters of Fate, who control destiny itself. And of course, without hesitation, Kratos hops aboard a conveniently located Pegasus and heads toward the Sisters of Fate. Seriously, where in the blue hell did this horse come from? Did Kratos just Pegasus jack someone? I mean, that does sound like something Kratos would do, but who just leaves the Pegasus there? Is there just free Pegasus parking in hell? I want answers! Get me the valet man! The best thing about God of War and the world it builds is that we are on the hunt for gods and titans that exist in Greek mythology. I may have said this last time, but Kratos feels like we have our own point of view in this story. In the first game, we played a man tormented by his past and wanting to end his life or suffering. Now we're a god who is betrayed by his own kind, and Kratos wants to murder everyone that stands in his path, including Zeus! For the love of God, it's Zeus. The love of gods. See what I did there? You will never be the ruler of Olympus. From its larger-than-life characters, to its epic set pieces, to its classy-looking locales, everything in God of War 2 looks like it was ripped right out of Greek myth. The game goes to great lengths to immerse you into its world and keep you there. It's delightful to run into and ultimately kill characters from Greek legend that you recognize. Damn, that looks just like me. The fact that so many of Kratos' weapons and abilities come straight from classic Greek tales only reinforces how much attention to detail the developers had when creating this world. For a game this old, it looks so damn pretty. Not only does the lighting help to create areas that appear atmospheric and elegant, it also helps to differentiate the vibe between the game's various locales. A city that's under siege looks appropriately different than a temple that hasn't been explored in years. Kratos himself moves smooth as silk. Damn. His animations are impressively fluid, especially in combat. This PS3 port, while not as beautiful in my opinion as the God of One port, is awesome. Everything is still on par as the previous game, if not a little better with regard to level design and artistic style. For someone who never played these games before, they look great in 720p. Few franchises do the whole remastering thing well, and God of War 1 and 2 are great examples of that. God of War 2 also utilizes a fixed camera angle, which keeps the focus directly on Kratos while he's in combat. The camera also clearly displays the impressive set pieces that are often present in the backgrounds. It's clear that presenting a big, grand sense of scope and scale was a priority for the developers, and opting to make sure the camera was always pointed where it needed to be pointed was a priority. This unique type of camera also allows for nearby bonus chests to remain hidden throughout the environments, which means that many of them can only be found through careful exploration. God of War's signature orchestral soundtrack is back in full force for the sequel. During battle, the music is relentlessly grandiose and it gets you so pumped. But when the music, when out of combat let's say, when exploring, is appropriately tranquil. Some of the best tracks in the game are the more serene ones. The sound effects are just the right amount of disturbing. When you fold an enemy in half and hear their bones crack, you can practically feel it yourself. God of War 2 is unapologetically epic. It's loud, fast, and completely over the top. But ultimately, it's a game that makes you feel like a badass while playing it. The game is so much fun that it does not matter how much of a meathead Kratos may be. Honestly, Kratos shouts every single line he says. By taking the blade of Olympus back and driving it into Zeus's heart, it holds the power I once wielded as the God of War. Stop shouting. I'm not deaf. I'm starting to think he has to yell. Kind of like how sharks have to keep moving or else they'll die. Shark week. The gameplay of God of War 2 comes down to combat, puzzles, combat, platforming, and combat. Seriously, even if you're not in a full-on battle, you're still probably hurting something. And it's great. The game's combo system is deep with a lot of room for self-expression and creativity. You've got quick light attacks, heavy attacks, damaging swings, and aerial flurries all at your disposal. And that's just the tip of the beatdown iceberg. On the defensive side of things, you've got a dodge to quickly move you out of harm's way. And eventually, Kratos gets an item that allows him to turn an opponent's own attack against them if the player perfectly times the press of a button correctly. It makes you feel like a boss. In addition to his famous Blades of Athena, Kratos can also wield other weapons which include a barbarian hammer and the frickin' Spear of Destiny. He's also got a slew of magic spells up his sleeve, such as lightning that chains between his foes, a stomp so massive that it quakes the ground around him, and the head of a gorgon that can turn enemies in its gaze into stone. And just in case all of this didn't make Kratos more Kratosy enough for you, he also has a brand new mode in this game called 
the Rage of the Titans. Once activated, Kratos deals out more damage and takes less damage for a limited time. I don't want to say it's like God mode because that's just a pun on this game overall, but you definitely feel like you're a god in this mode. Everyone just gets killed, everyone gets out of your way. You're invincible, you're the king, you're the man, you're the god of war. I could go on for days, you guys. Soldiers of both the living and the undead variety make up the majority of the enemies you'll encounter, but you'll be tearing your way through an entire beast series worth of creatures from all over Greek legend. From minotaurs to gorgons to cyclopses to hairy Hussein skeletons, no one is safe from Kratos' bad mood. Now, a lot of these guys are from God of War 1, but the designs have changed quite a bit. When you kill your enemies, a bunch of red orbs will burst forth and fly towards Kratos, which can be used to leveling up your weapons and spells. These similar orbs can be found by breaking objects in the environment and finding chests. These chests won't always give you red orbs, though. Sometimes they'll give you green or blue orbs, which refill Kratos' health and magic meters, respectively. You'll also come across chests that contain Gorgon eyes, which increase Kratos' max health, and Phoenix feathers, which increase his max magic. All of these things are not new, they're just reintroduced back into the game. So, if you've played God of War 1, it's just like God of War 1. The boss fights this time around are more memorable, unique, and utterly epic in scale. They require you to exercise the many skills, abilities, and weapons you've acquired over the course of the game if you expect to succeed. And all of these each one demonstrate how much of an artist Kratos can be when it comes to killing someone. The bosses and some of the game's tougher non-boss enemies will eventually display a giant button prompt over their heads when they've taken enough damage, doing big damage or killing the enemy altogether. Again, all these things are just from God of War 1, but enhanced, improved if you will. The platforming sections of the game also involve Kratos using his Blades of Athena to climb, crawl, and swing his way around obstacles. A lot of the time, you'll also have to kill a bunch of dudes who are dumb enough to get in your way while you're dangling. The puzzles of God of War 2 usually have Kratos pushing or kicking heavy objects into specific positions or pulling switches to activate mechanisms in the levels. In true brutal fashion, some of these puzzles require Kratos to use corpses or soon-to-be corpses as tools. Way to think outside the box. Like Taco Bell. That's... Is that Taco Bell's thing? Outside Live outside the bun, not outside the box. What's outside the box? I don't think there's a think outside the box. Thinking outside the box. There's got to be something outside the box, you guys. No, just think outside the box. Just like your thoughts. What is to think outside... Is that just a phrase? Yeah, it's, it's not Taco Bell. It's not Taco Bell, you guys. It could be Taco Bell. It, it could be... Are you really going to ask about Taco Bell? I, uh, look, we need to eat. Having murdered his way through mountains, swamps, and temples, Kratos finally comes face to face with the Sisters of Fate. He demands access to his own past, but when the sisters refuse Kratos, he calmly explains why it's imperative to him. Nah, <laughs> nah, just kidding. He murders them. He murders everyone, all three of them. With access to their loom chamber, Kratos finally returns to the moment of Zeus's betrayal. He manages to get his hands on the Blade of Olympus, and he and Zeus then fly high into the sky for their final battle. The first stage of the fight sees Zeus growing huge like a monster from Power Rangers and trying to zap you with lightning bolts. He also summons a bunch of ads to pester you, which turn out to be the key to defeating him. If you manage to avoid his projectiles and kill enough ads, Zeus will eventually shrink back down to your level. This time, he's ready to fight you mano o mano, or god o gado, like the butt boy he is. He throws dash punches and lightning strikes your way, and even steals the Blade of Olympus off of you. This is undoubtedly the hardest fight in the game. Zeus hits hard, is extremely fast, and rarely takes hit stun at all. You're going to have to read his patterns and attack only when absolutely safe in order to survive this fight. Given that you're only doing damage to him every once in a while, this fight can be a bit grueling. But with patience and a little bit of luck, Zeus will fall like all the rest. In an uncharacteristic move, Kratos gives in and kneels in front of Zeus, asking him to deliver the final blow to end his life. But just as the blade is about to fall, Kratos turns to grab Zeus in his moment of vulnerability. Athena shows up, pleading with Kratos to spare Zeus. But when Kratos tries to deal the final blow to Zeus, Athena throws herself in the way. With her dying breath, she reveals that Zeus is actually Kratos' father. That's impossible! You know, I really want to see how many times we can use that Skywalker clip on the show when talking about Dad's betrayal and reveals. I think we're at three now. 
Athena explains that Zeus has been trying to kill Kratos to end the cycle of patricide that started with Zeus killing his own father, the Titan Kronos, which is what really ignited the great war between the gods and the Titans years ago. Despite her warning to Kratos that killing Zeus would destroy all of Olympus itself, Kratos vows to murder his father, who has since flown the coop. Kratos returns to the Loom Chamber, which allows him to go all the way back in time to the moment the Titans lost the Great War. He brings every last Titan back with him into the present. And then, just as Zeus is rallying all the Olympian gods into a united cause against Kratos, Kratos invades Mount Olympus. With his new army of Titans at his side, Kratos has commanded time itself to bend his every- Oh, wait, hold on, wait a minute. If Kratos could go back to any moment in time, why would he go back to when Zeus betrayed him or back to the Great War? Why wouldn't he just go back to the day that he killed his own family and prevent himself from doing so? Wouldn't that just take care of all of his problems? He wouldn't be so tormented. He'd get a second chance. Progress. But this is a game, so I get that. Anyways, the point is, the game ends right here in this epic moment. Kratos riding the Titans into battle against the Olympian gods. Oh my god, I can't wait to play God of War 3. Zeus, your son has returned! I bring the destruction of Olympus! God of War 2 has a slew of unlockable content. Firstly, Titan Mode, a harder version of the main game, is unlocked the first time you beat the game, along with the mode called Bonus Play. Bonus Play is basically New Game Plus, allowing Kratos to retain all of his upgrades and weapons for a brand new adventure. And by brand new, I just mean the game over again. The Bonus Play really shines because of all the special abilities that can be activated during it by using the urns of power. Four of these urns can be found in the main campaign, and two of them are located in other bonus modes. When activated, these urns can do things like increase the amount of red orbs spawned, infinite magic, or make it so that any enemy you touch will turn into stone and die. Things can get hilariously broken in bonus play, so if you're looking for that, you're going to have a lot of fun with it. Completing the main game also grants access to the Challenge of the Titans, a series of seven extremely difficult combat challenges. These trials include killing a set amount of enemies under a time limit, and defeating all of your foes without getting hit once. This is by far the most challenging things the game has to offer, so check it out if you're looking to prove just how badass you are. You'll even get ranked on your performance, so no one can question your prowess once you're done with it. There's also the Arena of Fates mode, which is unlocked by earning the rank of Titan in the Challenge of Titans mode. This mode allows the player to specify extremely specific and customizable combat scenarios in a controlled environment. It's basically God of War 2's training mode. You get to choose which enemies spawn and how many of them spawn. You can even set them to continually respawn if you need to practice against that type of enemy. Kratos can also be customized, offering infinite health, magic, or rage of the Titans. Play to your heart's content. Finally, God of War 2 includes a nice amount of costumes for Kratos to wear on subsequent playthroughs. Five of them can be unlocked by beating the game on various difficulties. Another is unlocked by collecting 20 Cyclops eyes in the main game. And the last can be unlocked by achieving God ranking in the game's Challenge of the Titans mode. These costumes range from awesome to just silly. They include things like Kratos' original appearance, a giant codfish, or being able to play as Hercules or the goddess Athena herself. This isn't cosplay. This here is cost business. Athena, you will f God of War 2 is a fantastic sequel that keeps everything from the original, including the difficult parts. Yes, that's right, they're back. The difficulty modes are back and they're scarier than ever. Playing through the game on the Titan setting is a big pain in the ass. And while the rewards are fun, there isn't only really a point to play the game once you've completed all the challenges, and you guys get the point. But, like its predecessor, it's not that bad. The game is incredibly accessible, so with just a little bit of elbow grease, you can complete this game with ease. The sequel shines because of its story and compelling advancements in gameplay. Suffice to say, this is better than the first one, and I'm very excited to go on and play God of War 3, or Ghost of Sparta or Chains of Olympus, or Ascension. Wait, oh, oh, what, Ascension's bad? Oh, that makes me sad. Oh well, one day, one day.
God of War 2 is without a doubt an incredibly fun experience that more than deserves its place in PlayStation history. It consistently makes the player feel powerful and in control while keeping them immersed in the Greek mythology of the God of War universe. It plays great, it offers a lot of replay value, but if you're not into hack and slash games and you're not really a big fan of grinding for orbs or levels and getting really into the whole repetitive thing of replaying the end of the game over and over again to unlock things, this game may be a little bit much for you. So, with that in mind guys, I give this game my completionist rating of... Finna Pete It. Finna Pete It! Aries! Yes! Hey everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of The Completionist. Many years ago here on the show, I started my quest to get into new games. And when I say new games, it's because back in the day when I started the show, I was more of a retro gamer. But now I definitely play everything. And one of the newer games I played on my PS3, well, new-ish, was God of War. And here I am, nearly four years later, playing God of War 3 Remastered. And let me tell you, the journey that I have been on to play these games is one that I will never forget. These games are fantastic pieces of media that I wish I could consume like a bottle of root beer or a wine or something like that because it's so awesome. And honestly, I thought we were never going to see another God of War anytime soon. But then, at E3 this year, we saw a trailer for Dad of War and let me tell you, I'm so pumped to be a father. So today we are diving into the final game in the trilogy known as God of War 3, remastered on the PlayStation 4. Are all of you guys as hyped about the new God of War as I am? That E3 trailer came out of nowhere and blew me the hell away. I was in the audience at E3 when those singers came out and I was screaming into Jesse Cox's ear, it's God of War, watch it be God of War. And you know what, I was right. So far, the game looks impressive and almost unrecognizable as a God of War title. And with that beard and his mysterious young charge, Kratos really seems to be like the dad of war. Eat your vegetables! Be outside when I pick you up from soccer practice! Do not clutter the DVR with reality TV! I'm tired of watching the Kardashians! But before we jump into the new, we should take a look back at where we last left Kratos. God of War 3. We may be pretty familiar with the conclusion of the trilogy today, but it was actually originally intended to have a very, very different story. David Jaffe, the creator of God of War, originally wanted the plot to involve Kratos dismantling not only the Greek pantheon, but also the Nordic and Egyptian ones too. Oh, you run, God, Kratos is gonna get you! That didn't quite pan out, but when it comes to the final product, the guys at Sony Santa Monica really outdid themselves. They utilized the capabilities of the PlayStation 3 to create their most graphically astonishing and technically impressive game at the time. When God of War 3 was released in 2010, it became an instant classic, eventually getting a re-release on the PlayStation 4 as God of War 3 Remastered. And you better believe we're gonna play that version because I love my games pretty. The upcoming God of War is gonna change a lot about the series, but before Kratos officially becomes the dad of war, it's time for one last blowout. I mean, we still have Ghost of Sparta and Chains of Olympus, but whatever. This is kind of like Kratos' bachelor party, but instead of booze, there's blood. And instead of strippers, there are corpses. And instead of a best man, there's just more blood and corpses, but in the shape of a best man. Maybe? Yeah, that'll do. Just as a general disclaimer, and I don't think I really need to say this, but I do want to reiterate that if you're watching this episode, chances are you probably need to have watched our episode coverage on God of War 1 and 2. Or else why the hell would you go to the end of this? It's like reading an ending of a book right away. Read the other books! Last time on God of War! Kratos had taken his chronic, omnidirectional rage and focused it squarely on his father, Zeus. Zeus tried to kill Kratos, which is a big no-no. So Kratos is now returning the favor by leading Zeus's oldest and most powerful enemies, the Titans, straight up Mount Olympus. 
Zeus is crapping his pants a little bit, so he's rallied a few of his Olympian brothers and sisters to play some defense. Kratos and the Titan Gaia make it to the top and confront Zeus, but he bops them both with a big-ass lightning bolt. They go crashing down to the mountainside, and Gaia manages to grasp the cliff, with Kratos holding on to her for dear life. Kratos actually asks for help, but Gaia chooses to save herself, revealing that the Titans have just been using Kratos to exact their revenge on Zeus. Which, when you think about it, is exactly what Kratos was doing with the Titans, so, you know. Jesus Christ, Zeus, when so many people want to murder you, it's time to probably reevaluate yourself, see where you are, are you invited to parties on the weekend? Get it together. Gaia drops Kratos like a bad habit. Bad move, lady. All this guy does is kill and yell at people. Kratos then falls all the way back down to Hades. Sometimes you've gotta go where everybody knows your name. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? While swimming through the river Styx, the damned souls within eat away at all of his cool power-ups from the last game, effectively metroiding him. Kratos runs into his old pal-slash-victim Athena, who advises that if he wants to destroy Zeus, he needs to snuff out the Flame of Olympus, the source of Zeus's power. When asked why she'd help Kratos to kill Zeus when she previously sacrificed her life, for the old man, she just shrugs it off and floats back to the land of shoddy storytelling and cryptic excuses, but not before giving Kratos the Blades of Exile, sweet upgrades from the very beginning of the game. Kratos has got a long way to go and a lot of people to kill before he gets another shot at dear old dad. Oh, look at that. He's already started. What an eager murder beaver. The stories in God of War have always felt incredibly epic, but they've never felt as wide-reaching as they could have. We've seen the fallout of Kratos' actions before, but they've always affect just him and a few of the other gods for the most part. But this is the first time where Kratos' personal quest for vengeance is directly tied to the fates of just about everyone in the entire world. Killing an entire pantheon is going to have big ramifications on the world which is the only thing that the writers could possibly do to make Kratos seem more like an asshole. Think about it, he was already such a dick that they made him threaten the entire world to appear slightly worse. Honestly, that's really freaking impressive. God of War has always been a brutal over-the-top series, but God of War 3 somehow manages to take things even further. I mean, even out the gate, this game does something that very few games do, which I really love. It starts exactly where the last one left off. No time has passed. Literally just previously on God of War. This game was the finale of a trilogy and you can practically feel the developers pulling out all the stops. For all they knew, this could have been Kratos' last ride before he walked off into the sunset of retired video game IPs. Tons of elements are exactly the same as you remember them. The score still pendulums between being hype and grandiose during combat and somewhat serene and ambient while Kratos is puzzle solving. And you're still frequently reminded of just how small Kratos is. In the grand scheme of things, when the camera zooms out to show you these incredible scale shots. It's shots like these that really reinforces what an unwavering dick Kratos is in the face of insurmountable odds. Never tell him the odds because he'll just fucking murder you and then he'll kill those odds. And then he'll go back in time and kill that guy that invented a way to calculate those odds. God of War 3 has a few new tricks too, such as all of its cutscenes being made completely with in-game assets. Get out of here, you pre-rendered stuff. You're not popular anymore. And I didn't think it was possible, but the violence and gore actually got to me this time around. You'd think there was no way they could ramp up the kills, but stuff like the murder of Poseidon from his perspective are fuck gruesome. <laughs> God damn, great job, Sony Santa Monica Studios. You guys are monsters. The developers also seem to have tried expanding the narrative in God of War 3 by including way more readable books and notes. They give you a bit of flavor on the items, locations, and people you run into around ancient Greece. It's an admirable attempt to add depth to some characters and insight into the world. But this method of storytelling falls flat just a little bit in this game. God of War has always had pretty strong pacing, and these notes kind of impede 
read the pacing. You don't really have to read them, but the information that they convey could be done so in a way that doesn't stop you from doing what's most important. Splitting people wide the fuck open. The tidbits that they offer on characters are more backstory than they are development, and it even feels a bit out of character for Kratos to be boning up on anything. I mean, come on, does this look like a guy who reads regularly? Does this look like a guy who even reads? Can Kratos read? I don't know if that's... Can we confirm that? But this game visually steals the show. It looks absolutely gorgeous, especially when compared to God of War 2. And playing it on the PlayStation 4 makes it look even better. Mm! Kratos is looking so good after that HD makeover. The developers have always been good about crafting moments that show off their graphical prowess, and God of War 3 continues that tradition. Now that's the power of Pine Saw. I mean, the power of the PS4, baby. Woo! You do notice a bit in frame rate drops, though, during cutscenes. Gameplay's in 60, cutscenes are at 30. It's a little disorienting, personally, but that no way impedes my entire experience here. God of War is still big and loud, and God of War 3 is definitely the biggest, loudest, and most ambitious of them all. It's kind of like Fast and the Furious 7. Oh my god. Oh my god, you guys. Vin Diesel as live-action Kratos. You know he'd be down. The man plays D&D, &D, and he used to play with Street Shark toys. He's the leader of the Street Sharks. He's a great warrior. And like Kratos, he doesn't read, so that's kind of something they share in common. Just throwing shade at Vin Diesel for no I saw you consider it and still do it. There was no reason to today. There was no reason I know. I know. Hey, kid, you like fighting? Then God of War 3 will hook you the f up and jack you up on Mountain Dew, baby. Kratos is still whipping, punching, and ripping his way through every single monster from Greek mythos. Oh, and I guess there's some puzzles and exploration in there somewhere too, but murder! Even though the game's bread and butter is combat, the puzzles in the God of War series have always been pretty imaginative, and they've reached their pinnacle in this game. Coming soon, and featuring Kratos, it's the God of War rhythm game. Gigantic plastic contraption sold separately, but seriously, this Penrose step puzzle was especially cool. Check out the big brain on Kratos! The controls are basically the same that they've always been, and there are still plenty of quick time events and masturbatory mashing sequences. Yeah, press that button. But guess what? Kratos can finally switch between his weapons without pausing the game. You just have to press the D-pad to cycle between them, which you can do while active in combat! God of War's robust fighting system was just blown the hell open! We're finally Devil May Cry status, boys! Call up Capcom! We're taking them down! Oh wait, they did it themselves! Never mind, never mind, we're fine, we're fine! Kratos still ups his arsenal by collecting stuff from his defeated enemies, including weapons, spells, and a brand new subset of gear called items. Think of them like relics or artifacts. They're governed by a third meter, which you can increase by collecting Minotaur horns. Oh, before it was just Gorgons and the Phoenixes who had to worry about Kratos, but now he's coming for you, Minotaurs! Oh, you think those horns are yours? <laughs> They belong to Kratos now! Now this video would be about another 7 to 8 minutes too long to talk about all of Kratos' weapons, so I'll just cover my favorite from each category. A lot of the melee weapons you get in the game behave similarly to Kratos' classic Blades of Chaos. That is, except for the Nemean Cestus, a pair of badass giant lion gauntlets that might be the manliest thing I've ever seen in a video game. Yo, Kevin Sorbo, let's f go! 1v1 me. He's the, he's the voice of Hercules in the I game. Disappointed! Put that in there. Call that accent out. Oh, you want me to say? Just write it in there. Right. Type enter. Insert. Kevin Sorbo saying this play. Disappointed! I really enjoy Kratos' army of Sparta spell, which calls down the spirits of Kratos' slain brethren to create a phalanx shield around him. Aww, it's almost like he has actual friends. Kind of. And the coolest item in the game has to be the actual head of the sun god, Helios. You can illuminate dark areas with it and reveal secrets. That's a man's head. And that's not all. In combat, you can use it to temporarily blind your enemies, leaving them wide open. That's a man's head. The boss fights are still some of the most imposing and impressive aspects of the game. 
One of the things that the God of War series does well is weave a boss fight throughout the entire level or area. You'll periodically go back and forth between tangling with the boss and engaging in regular gameplay. Sometimes the boss will even make a brief appearance throughout the level, interacting with your environment and foreshadowing the fight to come. It's an example of storytelling in a manner that only a game can do. Don't you worry. There are still plenty of boss fights that are just ugly, intimate slugfests between Kratos and another guy. The gameplay in God of War 3 is the most refined and the most open it's ever been. A lot of games tend to get stale with its mechanics by the third time out, but Kratos just keeps on improving, which gives a lot of hope for the new God of War. I'm just wondering how they're going to Metroid him now that he's Kratos, Dad of War. Maybe he'll end up selling all of his mythical weapons to buy his son some school supplies. Thanks, Dad. Kratos is gone and fucked up. Thanks to his thirst for revenge, he's gone and triggered the goddamn apocalypse. For every Olympian god he's killed, and there have been a lot of them, the world has been plunged further into chaos. But I guess none of that matters now, cause he's gotta kill Zeus. Putting out the Flame of Olympus will expose Pandora's box, the same mythical item that set Kratos on his path many years ago, making him the god of war. But the only one who can extinguish those flames at the cost of her own life is little Pandora herself who's managed to befriend surly old Kratos. They've got kind of a Wolverine and Kitty Pride thing going on here, but at the moment of truth, Kratos won't allow Pandora to sacrifice herself. Why? I don't know. I get that she reminds him of his dead daughter, but this is the same guy who casually slaughters entire nations, which are undoubtedly filled with little girls who look even more like his daughter. They probably are, some of them. Pandora leaps towards the flames, they begin to suck her in, and when Zeus shows up, Kratos lets her go. With the flame put out, Kratos opens the box to find... Not a damn thing. The battle between Zeus and Kratos continues, eventually spilling over into Gaia herself, where Kratos gets the upper hand and runs Zeus through with the Blade of Olympus, piercing Gaia's heart at the same time. The victorious Kratos then turns his back on Zeus, giving the god the chance to grab his son and choke the life out of him. Kratos awakens in a realm of complete darkness, where he literally follows a trail of blood along a path of his most painful memories. But with the light provided by Pandora's spirit, Kratos manages to finally forgive himself for murdering his family. It's about goddamn time, dude, it only took three games! And then, in a move that no one saw coming, Kratos uses pure light of hope to snap out of the darkness and beat the living life out of Zeus, finally killing him. What you're about to see is one of the most brutal game sequences I've ever seen in my entire life. When I say that Kratos literally removes the life out of Zeus, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Athena shows up and explains that when Kratos first opened Pandora's box all those years ago, he didn't inherit the evil and fear that Zeus had hidden in there, but rather the power of hope that she had placed there. Wow, you know, they're really trying to make a hero out of this guy at the last minute. Guys, I don't care what you do, I'm not going to forget that this guy ruins families in his spare time. He's f awesome, he's just a homewrecker. Real talk, that dude makes kids cry. With no one left to kill, Kratos turns the blade on himself, releasing the power of hope to all of humanity. Or at least what's left of it since the world is done for at this point. And then, Athena leaves him to die. And that's all, folks. Kratos is dead, humanity is screwed, and no one learned a thing. Unless you stay until after the credits to learn that Kratos' body is nowhere to be found. It's a little bit of a cop out of how it ends, but I buy it. We've been through so much with Kratos. We've seen a lot of downs with almost no ups, but we've seen a man go from evil to the most evil. 
for the love of the god of war. He's the reason why all the gods are dead and that humanity starts anew. That's pretty damn rad. But nonetheless, we are left with the idea that Kratos is a changed man. Personally, I feel that while he was filled with hope, literally, at the end of this trilogy, we don't quite get the same effect as a hero. An anti-hero gone good isn't quite as appealing as it could be. An anti-hero gone evil doesn't sound good either. I would have loved more of a selfish choice. It's much more in his nature, but we've seen what the future holds for Kratos, and he's going to be the dad of war! Congratulations on beating God of War 3 Remastered. You've just unlocked a whole bunch of stuff. Firstly, you'll get a whole slew of behind-the-scenes videos and in-game cinematics. Everything from character designs to videos covering the game's voice actors are yours to enjoy now that you've murdered your father. Kratos now also has some new duds to try out. While none of them are as funny as previous games, these costumes are really badass, each offering a variety of special buffs and debuffs. Now, some of these costumes were pre-order bonuses from the previous console generation, so it's nice to have them here in one game. And I hope you've been collecting those godly possessions during your first run-through, because now you can finally use them. There are 10 special items that belong to the 10 gods and Greek heroes that you encounter in the game, and they're usually found near their owner's corpses after you brutally murdered them. On subsequent playthroughs, you can activate them to switch on all kinds of cool game-breaking effects. For example, Poseidon's conch shell gives Kratos infinite magic meter, but here's the catch. Once you've activated even one of the godly possessions, trophies will be completely locked out for the rest of that playthrough. Beating the game also unlocks a mode that returns from the previous game, but is now known as the Challenge of Olympus. It's still a series of seven extremely difficult fights, each with their own messed up set of rules. But if you beat them all, you'll unlock two other modes, the Combat Arena and the Challenge of Exile. The Combat Arena is a practice mode that will still let you customize battles to your heart's content. And the Challenge of Exile is an even more ramped up version of the Challenge of Olympus. Seven brand new battles that are even tougher than the first seven await you, and these fuck don't play around. This originally was DLC released for God of War 3 on the PS3, and unfortunately you are not rewarded with anything for your victorious efforts. It's just a place for Kratos to blow off some steam. That's right, it's okay, it's very healthy to express yourself. Alright, now let's talk trophies. I'm happy to report that most of them are extremely easy to acquire, and there aren't really any bullshit ones either. You've got to beat the game on Titan mode, but that's not much of a problem as it's the equivalent of hard mode. You've also got to beat all the challenges of Olympus, but there are only seven of them, and with the guide, you'll eventually make it happen, no problem. But the real nightmare in God of War 3 is also unlocked once you beat the game. Mother chaos mode. It is by far the hardest mode ever included in God of War history. Kratos is far easier to hit, enemies are smarter, and even the wimpiest ones can kill you in just a couple of hits. Everything was going smoothly just fine until you showed up chaos mode. Everything was fine. And the worst part is, and this is the plight of doing this for a living, you don't even get anything for beating it. Not even a trophy, it's just there to taunt you and waste your time. Checklist done. But since I'm the completionist, I've got to beat it anyways. And if you manage to unlock everything that the game has to offer, including every single trophy, you get not a damn thing. <sighs> I understand now, Kratos. If I had some gods to kill, I would. I'm so sorry I judged you and your methods. Kill them all. Kill them all. God of War 3 can be pretty tough. If you're prone to button mashing, then the late game in particular can give you some big, big problems, as it starts demanding that you actually use the various techniques that the game teaches you. The increased damage that you take in Titan mode only makes things worse, and don't even get me started on the horror that is known as Chaos Mode. But other than that, 
This game provides plenty of amusement across the board, and in my personal opinion, it is my absolute favorite God of War to date. In my playthrough of God of War 3, there were 74 deaths, 4 full campaign completion runs including Titan Mode and Chaos Mode, 46 hours of total playtime, 14 challenges bested, 10 godly possessions pilfered, 96 Gorgon Eyes, 96 Phoenix Feathers, and 96 Minotaur Horns hunted, 35 trophies unlocked on the PS4 version, however I also completed the PS3 version in anticipation of this review before the remastering was announced a long time ago, and that was another 36 trophies, totaling to 71 trophies unlocked. Oof. And 18 months of personal training before I can complete my Kratos Dad cosplay. This is one of those games that the completion value is determined by the player's personal completion criteria. Obtaining every trophy is not actually that much of a chore, but if you insist on running through chaos mode, then you're just begging for punishment. Playing the game normally, however, is more than a good time. It's a chance to experience the culmination and pinnacle of everything that is the classic God of War, and I cannot wait to be the Dad of War. Part of me is a little bit sad because here on the show we've reached the end of a trilogy of a series and yes, we still have Ghost of Sparta and Chains of Olympus and God of War Ascension in the very beginning of all this, but the original trilogy of God of War is incredible. The entire experience is one that I think about all the time. It's a great game. God of War 3 Remastered on PS4 is awesome. I cannot recommend it enough. If you're a completionist, however, this is kind of a toss up in the air, grain of salt situation. Do you like going the distance and beating a lot of things and liking the challenge of several challenges and hard mode playthroughs? Or are you kind of more of a narrative person that just wants to get to the end of the game but really fulfill the story that we've been working towards so hard? It's honestly up to you. Me personally, I'm kind of somewhere on the higher end of the scale. I like the difficulty, I like the challenge, I like beating all of the modes. The problem is, you don't get much for it in this version of the game. So, with that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of Finish It. Finish It! Ares! Yes! One of the coolest opportunities I received here on the show is playing games I never played before. And many, many years ago, I got to play the very first God of War, and I was blown away. I played the second, I loved it so much more, I played the third, and the third ended up being my favorite one in the series thus far. And when I got to the end of that journey, I got really bummed out because there weren't really any more God of War games that I wanted to really dive into. Well, there's actually three more that I haven't played yet, so I thought, you know what? With E3 around the corner, Hopefully more information on Dad of War coming around. I want to get back in to God of War with Ghost of Sparta for the PSP. Back in March of 2010, as people started platinuming their brand new copies of God of War 3, people were confused by a description for the Platinum Trophy itself, which showed the URL for a website called SpartanStandTall.com. Originally, it was just rain falling on an ocean and slowly filling up a meter in the shape of a Spartan shield, and it seemed to be filling up more and more as people tended to unlock that platinum trophy. No one knew what was happening, fans were speculating like crazy, and when the meter finally filled up a month later, fans retreated to an image of Kratos with the first ever mention of the title, God of War Ghost of Sparta. At E3 later that year, we eventually found out that this was going to be the follow-up to the very well-received PSP game Chains of Olympus from two years earlier. The game was going to be developed by Ready at Dawn Studios, who most people now know as the studio behind the beautiful yet frustratingly brief PS4 exclusive The Order 1886. So, absolutely zero time passes between God of War 2 and 3, and the story loses absolutely no momentum right there. But between 1 and 2, the developers saw a little bit of a hole to fill in there, and honestly, I completely agree with them. Other than he was once a Spartan general, and that Ares tricked him into murdering his family in a blood rage, Ares! 
And that now as Fami's ashes are completely covering his skin, there really isn't much we know about Kratos and why he's able to slaughter god after god like a little kid at McDonald's getting a 20-piece chicken McNugget combo. Have you ever seen that happen? Those kids are scary. Who are his parents? Did he have any siblings? Is it finally time for him to put his dirty laundry out to dry? Did he ever fight a giant shark monster for no real reason? It's these questions and more that Ghost of Sparta is trying to answer. And more importantly, this is my first look at a God of War game on anything besides the most technologically advanced home console of the time. Is it really possible that a PSP game is going to give me that same great feeling? I mean, we played the PS3 version, so no, but yeah. I know the PSP's whole thing was like, f the DS, here's the console gaming experience in the palm of your hands. But the typical portable console user is playing for much shorter amounts of time in one sitting in places like on public transportation or the bathroom. And a lot of the time, what tends to happen is developers clumsily try to shoehorn the same basic gameplay from the console version into bite-sized little pieces. And you get a AAA franchise game with what I call PSP-itis. Less features, shorter campaigns, padded with tedious grinding, worse graphics, and compromised control schemes. If you or anyone you know has PSP-itis, contact a medical professional immediately. Telltale signs include cramping in your left hand, blurred vision, and carrying around and owning a copy of Hellboy on UMD. The first one's underrated, you guys. I'm telling you. Ghost of Sparta's got some pretty big shoes to fill and some teeny tiny PSP-sized feet. And by the end, we'll make the call either way. But now, let's see what us completionists have in store. Looks like the game itself is only gonna run me about 10 hours max, probably closer to six and a half, maybe even seven and a half, and I'll probably have to complete the game two or three times to account for both hard and very hard mode difficulties. And aside from a handful of unmissable plot-based achievements, some challenge modes, and a few collectibles along the way, I don't feel too worried about getting stuck in this game completely for days on end. But all that really means is that my review is gonna come down to one important thing. Is this game actually fun? So you know what? Screw it. Let's get started. Goes to Sparta, the ball's in your court. Keep on fire! At the top of the game, Kratos is literally just sitting on his throne, chilling, because he killed Ares at the end of God of War 1, and now he's the new God of War. He's just sitting there when all of a sudden he starts having these weird visions of a conspicuously tattooed kid sparring with another young dude, and a sad old lady on a stone slab at Poseidon's temple in Atlantis, which is still above water at this point, by the way. Now, I'd assume someone with a life as jacked up as Kratos's would naturally have all kinds of PTSD to deal with, but something about these visions is a little off. So, by the power of shoddy storytelling, Kratos sets off to Atlantis against the advice of his on-again, off-again best friend slash Game of Thrones-style betrayer Athena to see what it's all about. Just as he's about to arrive, though, for absolutely no other reason besides sheer awesomeness, he's attacked by a giant version of Homer sea monster Cilia, except instead of looking like an ancient Greek monster, it looks more like the shark from Maui and Sons. Kratos fights it all across the city and eventually kills it, and weirdly enough, finds his mom Callisto behind some weird fourth wall-breaking door sitting exactly like she was in his vision. Kratos is still that stone-cold sourpuss from the first game, and it's very evident right here in this exchange. Kratos sees his mom for the first time in years. He didn't even know that she was still alive, and he's very confused about the entire situation. But she explains that not only is she alive, but his brother Deimos is as well. Kratos thought that he was also dead, but in this case, he is alive and well, but his soul is being held captive by Thanatos, the god of death. Callisto almost reveals the true identity of Kratos' father, but then she begins to morph into a monster for some unknown reason, and with no real hesitation, Kratos beats her to death against her will, and then stabs her for good measure. And she thanks Kratos for his thoughtful gesture. Wow, son, you are the best. You just beat the sh** out of me, and I can't thank you enough for it. Kratos may have killed his mom in cold blood, but at least now he's super pissed at both the gods and himself, just like always, and he knows what he has to do next. Save his brother we never knew existed from a lesser-known Greek god no one gives a shit about. 
And from there, things move pretty fast, and some of the stuff is undeniably awesome. We meet the Titan Thera, we find out that Kratos is responsible for sinking Atlantis, we find out that King Midas, yes, that King Midas exists, and yet somehow I can never really shake the feeling that we're seeing the B team all here. All this stuff is super cool, and you even get to go back to Atlantis when it's underwater and get some half important character revelations from people like Kratos' brother Deimos. But if there ever was a memo from Santa Monica Studios to Ready at Dawn about what they could and could not do with their story, I bet it said something along the lines of, it can be cool, but put everything you play with right back where you found it. And in this case, that unfortunately includes Kratos' character arc as well. If we know one thing about Kratos, it's that at least at one point in time, he cared very deeply about the family that is now permanently caked onto his skin. But when he finds out that his mom is alive and that she lied to him and that he has a brother trapped somewhere, he doesn't cry or ask many questions or even really pause for more than 30 seconds to think. Instead, he just raises his voice and gets really amped on murdering gods like he always does. With Kratos sitting on his throne like he was at the beginning of the game, this could have been our chance to finally see Kratos acting as a god, and the backstory we learn about here is definitely interesting enough to have shown us a new side of Kratos the man, but instead, it kind of just feels like they leaned on the formula and hoped the game looked enough like a God of War game for people to accept it as good enough on a PSP. And actually good enough might not exactly be accurate because goddamn, I can't believe this game ever ran on a PSP. I mean, yes, we are playing this on the PS3 because they released it in HD in 60 FPS, but here, just take a look at some of this actual PSP footage and tell me this isn't one of the most beautiful PSP games you've seen. Another symptom of PSP-itis that a lot of games exhibit is skimped production values with no voice acting and cinematic cutscenes being replaced with still images or moving comics a la Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker, but not so for God of War, baby. The entire voice cast is back for more. The music is just as epic as it's always been. And my absolute favorite thing about God of War, its mastery of conveying scale is completely intact. It makes Kratos feel like a tiny little underdog who just David and Goliath's dudes left and right. It's awesome, and I hope Dad of War lives up to this great tradition of the future. This series is known for pushing the limits of whatever console it's on, and Ghost of Sparta is no exception. I have no idea how Ready at Dawn got the PSP to look this good, but it's way easier to understand why the Order 1886 has incredible graphics. These guys just get it. And you know, all in all, Ghost of Sparta isn't that bad of a package. The story isn't well presented, but it kinda has to be light so that people playing in shorter bursts can remember what's going on. And the sheer production value here on what originally was a PSP game far outshines any story-based head-scratching I did during my playthrough. Sure, it's not as beautifully textured, well-lit, or fluidly animated as God of War 3 or the absolutely stunning Ascension, but for a PSP game to look just as impressive as a AAA PS3 game in the HD remaster is incredible. And if the mechanics are just as clean, this week might be a little bit more fun than I originally thought. Combating God of War Ghost of Sparta is, well, it's just like every other God of War thus far. You've got your chains, you've got a few other things, the combos are the exact same, you've got the interrupts, and that's basically the gist of it. Admittedly, it probably isn't taking very many risks because again, PSP-itis, contact your doctor now, but it does mix things up with a neat lighting your blades on fire mechanic in place of your normal armor piercing rage mode. And since we visit Sparta in this game and get to see them completely rebuilding Ares' old temple to worship Kratos, there's also the traditional Spartan spear and shield, which works both up close and at range, just in case you want to make your best Leonidas face. It's all cool stuff, and there's less of it in this smaller package, but there's nothing really offensive about the combat here. It's just not super fresh, especially considering that God of War 3 came out earlier that same year and had so much more stuff in it. Now people will argue it's a different company, they didn't want to mess it up, they wanted to keep the game familiar, and I understand all of that and that's all okay. The combat's not bad, 
bad. I actually like it a lot. It just feels like I'm playing God of War 1, God of War 2, God of War 3. It all just kind of feels the same. Some would argue that's a good thing. Some will argue it's a bad thing. I'm kind of right in the middle. The level designs on the whole are pretty good, especially considering how impressive they look for what originally was a 480 by 272 pixel screen. But just like with the combat, everything's a little quicker and a little smaller. The boss fights are just a little bit less intricate, the set pieces go by a little faster, and there's just less levels in the game overall than usual. But the element of God of War that suffered the most in this abbreviated version of the game were the puzzles. I typically like the puzzles in God of War, but the ones in Ghost of Sparta are either particularly simplistic and boring, or super unclear about where I need to go in order to be able to do something really simplistic. Maybe that's just because if you're going to be playing this for 20 minutes on a train, they didn't want you to spend that whole time stuck on a puzzle. But playing it on the PS3 made much of the typically welcome, quieter parts of the game much more tedious and slowed down the typical good flow of action quite a bit. As far as actual difficulty goes, nothing was ever too crazy, though I did have my fair share of dying on very hard mode. And of the three categories of collectibles that you need to max your stats out, the Gorgon Eyes, the Phoenix Feathers, and the Minotaur Horns, you only need 15 of each. And there's plenty more than that in the game. It's never challenging to find them either. It's kind of like playing God of War with little PSP training wheels, where just in case your hands hurt too much or there's a scary hobo on that train, you can still grab a little trophy for participation and pretend you're playing one of the better ones back home. Altogether though, Ghost of Sparta is a pretty damn good time to be honest. If you love Kratos and imagining yourself as Kratos as much as I do, and you're constantly on the go, who cares if the game is a little truncated? They clearly tried their best and did better than most franchises who try this. So if you were ready to compromise anyway, isn't this kind of like them knocking it out of the park? If you think about God of War and the legacy that Santa Monica Studios has created here, all they really want to do is provide stellar gameplay with a fun and exciting backdrop of Kratos and the gothic mythic world, and that is really, really fascinating stuff. At the point of this game, God of War 3 meant this franchise was over, but fans want more. Fans always want more, at least in my experience. However, sometimes too much of a good thing is kind of bad. Technically speaking, this was the last God of War game before we saw Ascension. And we all know how Ascension turned out. So for me, as far as a portable goes, Ghost of Sparta is a super solid title. It's super fun, and the gameplay, while it's the same as the others, doesn't really matter because the game is fun. Video games are fun. Reviews are weird. Video games are fun. There you go. One hundred percent completion of Ghost of Sparta is pretty simple stuff. As I said before, there's a bunch of trophies to unlock that are mostly automatic and are tied to progression, but there's also a few that required me to get collectibles or grind out a repetitive task in combat, and none of those were really tough either. However, once you do beat the game, a bunch more stuff gets unlocked. We've already explained that beating hard mode unlocks very hard mode, but finishing the game once on any difficulty also gives you access to an adjustable combat arena for grinding out orbs, as well as the Challenge of the Gods mode, which are a set of 13 challenges from Ares to Athena that are kind of fun and a little more arcadey in feel. But there is one challenge called Unscathed, which is kind of frustrating because you have to defeat four waves of enemies without taking a single hit, which even the best can fail multiple times without sucking at the game. Or at least that's what I tell myself, because god damn it was pretty annoying. But that's not even it, because there's also the Temple of Zeus, which is kind of like a store that wants you to grind for orbs so you can buy things like the Athena God Challenges, behind the scenes clips, game art, and most importantly, a costume and a godly relic. Yep, the Relic of the Gods are making a return from God of War 3. All you gotta do to get them is grab them as you play through once and then beat the game. And just like last time, each one grants you a special ability, like infinite magic, or allowing red orbs to count for 10 times as much when you get them. As you complete various tasks, you unlock a few different costumes, including God Armor Kratos, his brother Deimos, and a hilarious cardboard Kratos costume that boosts your defense. I think it's called Robo Kratos? Rob Robotos, that's the one. But the most interesting one of all is the Gravedigger Shovel, which lets you play as the Gravedigger in the combat arena only. 
Funny thing is, and this is kind of a spoiler, but if you've been with us thus far in the God of War reviews on the show, then it's not really a spoiler, so letting you know. But you're wrong! Shut the f*** up. The spoiler section is gone. I know all of you are butthurt about it, but analytically, YouTube told me that none of you are watching it anyway, so I'm sorry. Oh, no! I'm sorry! I'm sorry! The Gravedigger actually turns out to be Zeus elsewhere in the God of War story, and sure enough, while it's the Gravedigger who shows up, it's kind of Zeus who you're literally playing as in the arena, and it's awesome. Shame you can't use him in the regular game, which kind of sucks, but still. This is a classically satisfying get everything reward, and it's extra sweet because it didn't take that much effort to get it. Once that's done, all that's left is one last very hard mode playthrough to get you the sort of sepia tone goes to Sparta costume to match the filter on the flashback cutscenes in the game. This is definitely neat looking, but not as cool as getting to play as Zeus, even if it's just in the arena. In my completionist playthrough of God of War Goes to Sparta on the PS3 Remaster, there were 15 Gorgon Eyes, 15 Phoenix Feathers, 15 Minotaur Horns, 6 Relics of the Gods, 13 Challenges of the Gods, literally 1 million red orbs grinded out in the combat arena, 29 deaths, and a total playtime of 33 hours, 23 minutes. All right, I made that part up. I actually did this game in about eight hours. Easy peasy. All in all, Ghost of Sparta is a pretty damn good time. It's legit, but it's still a kind of tiny version of God of War. The completion stuff seemed super daunting, but when I actually went and did it, it wasn't that bad at all. By nature of God of War, it's fun. And as one of my favorite franchises of all time, playing a truncated but still pretty decent version of it for a week wasn't the worst thing in the world. The main problem with the PlayStation Portable versions of God of War games is kind of coming down to one key aspect. This is a small game. In fact, both of those games are relatively small, and the adventure attached to them doesn't feel small. It feels very important for our protagonist Kratos to find out more about his past and kind of where he's going in his lineage of being a god. I will say that the gameplay is very fun, it's very fascinating, but it's all very much the same. It's not a bad thing. I love this game a ton. It just didn't have enough new to make me really care. I just got enough information about who Kratos was and who he's going to be, but not really enough as a character. And that's kind of the saddest thing to me in this overall picture of this game, is that I want to know anything and everything about Kratos. So, with that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of Finish It. Finish it! Ares! The newest God of War was incredible. It rescued a once great game series from the brink of staleness, and with overhauled gameplay and a more thoughtful and mature narrative, it launched it into a bold and revered new direction. But such drastic improvements may have inadvertently spoiled the rest of the franchise. After enjoying something's evolved form, is it still possible to appreciate what it used to be? Does the answer to that question change when we directly compare the new and improved to what's reputably the series' creative low point? Here's hoping that I find something worthwhile when I complete God of War Ascension. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of The Completionist. Now, as many of you guys have known for the past few years, I have been obsessed with God of War as a franchise. I have played almost all the God of War games, and with Ascension, there's only one game left I haven't played, and that being uh, the Chains of Olympus, if you will. I was very excited to play Ascension when it first came out. It was the kind of game that I knew I wanted to play because I love Kratos as a character, I love his origin story, I love where he came from, and I love the path of destruction and chaos that he has to kind of metal himself throughout. When it came to Ascension though, everyone across the board kind of crapped on it. And for me, it made me want to not play the game. I just let kind of outside influences drown out my personal opinions and feelings about it before I even played it. And I learned early on while doing this stuff on YouTube that I should just not listen to anyone and do my own thing. Well, I've learned that it's not too late and I'm now playing God of War Ascension now. So, uh, grab some popcorn, if you eat popcorn when you watch videos, and come with me on the journey that is God of War Ascension. Let's begin. 
Yes! Right. God of War 3 kind of ended the franchise. It certainly left things open-ended enough for future entries, but it definitely wrapped up Kratos' story in a nice little package. So when the people at Sony Santa Monica Studios started popping off about how the franchise wasn't over, a lot of questions were suddenly raised, which were eventually answered by 2018's game of the year, God of War. Is Kratos still alive? Yes, he is. Is he gonna travel the world and bop other pantheons? Oh, most definitely. Will this new game feature another playable character? Boy! But none of these questions would actually be answered by the God of War 3 follow-up, since it turned out to be... a prequel. And then there were the rumors that this new God of War prequel would include online components. And as we all know, nothing sullies proven single-player series faster than online components. But during the entire development process, Sony Santa Monica continued to assuage fans and critics that they were really being careful about how they were implementing these multiplayer elements. Now they claimed they wanted to include multiplayer in past God of War entries, so it wasn't like it was just shoehorned in. That didn't stop reports from surfacing about the developers constantly shifting focus between single player and multiplayer. It sounded like this game didn't know what the hell it wanted to be, and that did not bode well for Kratos. But when God of War Ascension was released in 2013 for the PlayStation 3, everybody seemed to enjoy it. It got generally favorable reviews, mostly due to its feeling like just another God of War game. But in all honesty, I kind of forgot it existed. I never played it, and I certainly don't remember anyone being excited about it. So I guess it didn't exactly set the world on fire, which makes sense. At that point in the series, everyone was used to the God of War formula, which was still great, but there are only so many times you can rip apart Greek myth with your bare hands before it starts to lose its magic. So if I'm gonna complete God of War Ascension, I'm pretty sure I know just where to start, beating the campaign. There are trophies for beating this game on certain difficulties, so I'm just gonna get that train rolling by starting with hard mode. Along the way, I'll be making sure to upgrade Kratos completely, including all of his magic attacks and a couple of artifacts. Damn, man, how much more can you upgrade yourself, man? What Greek characters haven't you murdered or mugged yet? Well, I guess at this point, it is the beginning of the murdering and the mugging, so no one, which means everyone's on the table. After that, my next task will be to knock out New Game Plus, as well as revisit certain chapters for some cleanup duty. Certain trophies can only be unlocked by backtracking with certain gear, and almost all of them involve hurting someone. You know, I forgot how single-minded Kratos used to be. Ares. Ares! Ares! Next up, I'll be tackling yet another campaign run, but this time on Titan Mode, the game's hardest difficulty. Normally, I wouldn't be too worried about the challenge, but wouldn't you know it, the word on the street is that this is the hardest God of War to complete on the hardest setting. And if that wasn't enough, there's also the multiplayer. We're talking multiple factions to level up, prestiging several times, and even some good old RNG to boot. Why in God's name have the servers not been shut down for this game by now? Actually, you know what? Are you messing with me? Yeah, I'm messing with you. They're still up. <laughs> Come on, man. Not cool. God of War Ascension is 100% the same old God of War. Well, maybe 95%? There are a few instances when it exhibits a style all its own, but for the most part, it's just another brusque and bloody trip through ancient Greece with good old Uncle Kratos. This game would be just as enjoyable as the other classic God of War games if it just weren't for that pesky law of diminishing returns. The writers kick things off by telling their story out of sequence. Bold move, considering that this is also a prequel. It's like asking your audience to juggle and eat crackers at the same time. Allow me to unravel this tangled timeline of a plot for you. Ascension takes place not long after Kratos sold his soul to Big Bad Ares, and only months after Ares tricked him into cutting up his family into Suvlaki. Kratos did not appreciate that shit. 
so he pieces the hell out of there. But Greek mythology has these ladies known as the Furies who really get off on punishing people who break their oaths. Like, seriously, it's all they do. So Kratos is on the run from them, but in the meantime, they're able to remotely mess with his mind for some reason. Their magic fury powers bombard Kratos' brain with illusions, making him unable to trust his own senses, and subjecting him to repeated visions of that time he sliced into his wife and daughter like they were a wedding cake. Kratos is confronted by a shady dude who says that he needs to seek out the Oracle at Delphi in order to stop his cuckoo crazy head pictures. And off he goes, killing just about everyone he meets along the way. Oh, right, and the narrative keep shifting back and forth between that plot and another one in which Kratos has already been captured by the Furies. I guess something went wrong in that journey, huh? Kratos busts out of his prison made out of a giant man and sets his sight on punishing the Furies for making him insane in the membrane. While completing this game, I kept trying to figure out why they would choose to frame the story in such a complex manner, and my best guess is that it afforded them the most ass-beating possible. But what rubs me the wrong way is that in all the time they took to avoid convention, they never made any effort to make me care about Kratos at all. It's a serious case of telling instead of showing. Just imagine if players were able to play through Kratos' last errand for Ares. It would sure go a long way in helping us understand and care about Kratos' choices. Plus, you'd get your obligatory action-packed cold open. Instead, we got a narrative that feels like a mishmash of half-baked ideas that are clearly chosen in order to avoid interfering with the already established God of War canon. Remember, if it's a prequel, nothing substantial can happen in the narrative. You can find little tidbits of lore strewn about, but they're nothing substantial, and they're hardly immersive. Like scribblings on a wall in a horror game, or discovered documents in a mystery. Look, I'm not saying I hated Ascension's story, I'm saying there was barely a story at all. And to that point, I missed story time on the boat with my boy. I did enjoy the moments of pure spectacle in this game. The God of War series had basically perfected the art of epic vistas at this point, and Ascension contains plenty of moments where the sheer scale of your environments will make you stop and smell the flowers. And of course, there are several instances where the raw depictions of violence will leave you slightly slack-jawed. There's clearly someone on the dev team whose job is coming up with new ways for Kratos to kill things. And there are some cool new enemies to tear apart. It seems like they brought out the bestiary for some of these guys. We've got Manticores now, and these mammoth men are Oh my god, that's his brain, my dude! Brain surgery aside, Ascension felt like one long spell of deja vu. I felt like I'd been there, done that, and seen it all before. Even the prison made out of a giant man feels like something I'd seen in this franchise before. But an enormous bug torso exploding out of a huge arm? Now that's a new one. Neat. It's pretty striking to hear Living Singles TC Carson as Kratos again. I'd almost forgotten how much younger he sounded back in the day. And, you know, all the yelling. <laughs> the sound design can still get the blood pumping with massive explosive sounds and the ever-present orchestral arrangements accompanying Kratos' journey. But at the end of the day, I kind of have a hard time remembering any of it because I don't feel much connection to it. Ascension is like one of those movies that people make apologies for by saying things like, it's good for what it is, or you'll enjoy it if you go in with the right expectations. Well, I went in with very low expectations. And I suppose they were met, but that doesn't mean the game is worthy of praise because of it. Let's not let our low expectations create undeserved accolades. That's how we get Chappies. Remember Chappie? Remember Die Ant Word? Die Ant Word? How do you pronounce that? Die Ant Word. Die Ant Word. Die Ant Word. Die Ant Word. I know I completed God of War Ascension, but trying to remember the details of it is like trying to remember a dream from last night. I'm sure stuff happened, but that stuff was so indistinguishable from the other God of War games that I can't keep it straight. I know there was like a lot of blade twirling, like all the time in and out of combat. And I know that all the fighting was occasionally punctuated by some Tarzan platforming and a puzzle or two. The only part of the game that I do remember, which happens to be burned into my mind from repetition, is the multiplayer. This is not a good thing. When it comes to the campaign, things are as linear as ever, with a singular path that's crafted to drop the player into as many cinematic views and badass fights as possible. No side quests here. You just tear a path from point A to point B. Oh, and there are a handful of these sliding sequences now, so that's something. 
We. The biggest changes to the God of War formula lie within the combat. Instead of collecting a bunch of different mythological weapons and trinkets over the course of the game, Kratos can now instead switch between a bunch of color-coded power-ups for his Blades of Chaos. Each one is based on a different member of the Greek pantheon and alter Kratos' moveset in different ways, changing up his combo enders, his magic spells, and even his rage mode. You've got your Roasty Toasties from Ares, some Frosty Freeze from Poseidon, a bit of shock therapy from Zeus, and some dead people aka purple drink from Hades. While each style has their own strengths and capabilities, they don't really change up Kratos' base moveset as much as a completely new weapon would, but it does feel good to switch between the styles on the fly mid-combat. Several enemies in the game also match the color-coded element shtick, so they were clearly going for a theme here. Actually, there are other weapons for Kratos to use in Ascension, but they are temporary and you have to find them in the environment or rip them off of your enemies. On top of that, they're not even that exciting. We're talking about basic swords, spears, and clubs. No more legendary weapons from Greek myth. Now, you've got a slingshot. Now, I get what they were going for. On paper, adapting your environment and occasionally mixing up your weapons sounds exciting. But when you compare a basic sword to the blades that can summon giant spectral hands to grow bad guys to death, one of the two choices loses its luster. That's not to say that the elemental system is perfect either, as it seems like the idea wasn't committed to fully. Like, if you're gonna have enemies with elements that match your own, why not add some depth to your combat by having some of the elements be strong against others? You know, get a little rock, paper, scissors action in there. Or if you want to have different weapon varieties, maybe make each element change the shape or functionality of your blades a little bit. Or maybe that would be too close to making each element their own weapon entirely, which in turn would be too close to what every other God of War game has done. Whatever, in short, the combat in God of War Ascension is plenty of fun, with as much room for self-expression as always. And just as many quick time gore explosions. <laughs> kind of wish they would have put more trust in their choices to shake things up. Maxing out all of Kratos' gear was just a matter of keeping my eyes open while I played. There were plenty of red orb chests right along my path, or just off that path, giving me plenty of opportunities to level up. Plus, there are certain movesets in Kratos' element arsenal that always yield bonus red orbs. So, as long as you are thorough, Kratos will definitely be all decked out by the end of the game. No fuss, no muss, no guides needed. And you don't even really need a guide to hunt down the game's main collectibles. They're called artifacts, there aren't that many of them, and as long as you're not asleep at the wheel, you'll stumble across them all. They add some cool wrinkles to the gameplay by allowing players to toggle on cheats and modifiers in their New Game Plus runs, but I guess speedrunning through New Game Plus with infinite magic and rage didn't really help this game feel less like a blur. Besides, it wasn't like my first playthrough was that tough anyways. There were a few sequences that stopped me in my tracks for a while, like a couple of elevators where they throw waves of bad guys at your face. But aside from that, beating Ascension's campaign wasn't a problem. And with the chapter select feature, going back and getting straggler trophies was a breeze too. Well, throwing 1,000 lightning bolts at a rock was a bit tedious, but definitely still easy. Now, Titan mode was a different story. This was the mode that finally made me sit the hell up and pay attention. Beating Titan mode took me a good long while, which was expected since the hardest difficulties in God of War games always necessitate learning to play without getting hit at all. In retrospect, going straight from New Game Plus, where I ungabunged my way through with the artifact cheats, to Titan mode, where I had to be virtually perfect, may have been a mistake. The boss fights might actually be the most memorable part of this game. They're no different from the rest of the classic God of War boss fights, they just provide the big amounts of that spectacle that I previously mentioned. They're satisfying, just not extraordinary. And that basically describes Ascension to a T. It feels utterly ordinary at this point. Wait, let me rephrase that. This game would feel utterly ordinary if it weren't for the multiplayer mode. It definitely captures the spirit of God of War's gameplay and translates it pretty accurately to a multiplayer arena. But the sheer amount of stuff to complete in this mode invalidates every other experience before it. Once you start on the multiplayer, there is only the multiplayer. Forever and ever, amen. The more fleshed out elemental magic system is great. 
four different factions based on four different Greek gods is cool too. Each player having their role to play is a smart idea. But all that good flies out the window when you realize that in order to complete this game, you're gonna have to level up each faction to the max level several times over and over. I don't care how good your multiplayer mechanics are. If you have to stay there until you retire, it doesn't feel good. And Ascension's multiplayer mechanics are satisfactory at best. I'd probably feel better about if I was able to find matches consistently, but I don't think anyone would be surprised to hear that the community is not the most active nowadays. So I had absolutely no remorse about recruiting people from the Beer Brothers Discord to help me boost my way to victory. A big thank you to ERG Apollo, Harvest, Mass Defect 1, Ray Ray, Caprio, Nightshade, Some Science Cat, Stale Moves McGee, Stardust, Stella Potato, and Verant. Without these guys, I would not have been able to knock any of this out. With our 2v2 private lobby setup, it took about two hours to get from level one to 40, and then prestige. Each faction has unique gear as rewards, but you can only purchase them with ascension tokens, and you can only get those by prestiging. So that's several pieces of gear across four factions, which equals over 100 hours of gameplay. They didn't make this process easy either. The servers would consistently drop one of our players or more out of the game, rotating in a random player who would then ruin our game plan. That's right, it would change the private lobby we had to a not so private lobby. Get out of our lobby. This is not a for fun lobby. This is a, this is my job lobby. The multiplayer increased my playtime with God of War Ascension by around 10 times. It's clear that getting all the multiplayer gear was never intended for anyone to do. And it's a shame that I never got to experience this game in its heyday. I'm sure actually playing in some matches instead of waiting for hours to find one was actually real fun. But at the end of the day, this seems like a multiplayer diversion with the campaign tacked onto it. Completing this game has made me appreciate the latest God of War even more. Now more than ever, I get why the developers felt they needed to change things up. It's simple. If your game hinges on making people react to exciting gameplay and massive displays of spectacle, you have to keep surprising them. But this wasn't the way to do it. This is a very different God of War game, but it doesn't feel like the God of War people wanted. You know, like the one where Kratos hops between multiple dimensions to take down several pantheons in one game. Egyptians, gone. Aztecs, body. Judeo-Christian God, now that's DLC, but it'll be worth it. Oh, come on, man. I was rooting for this game. But here we are with God of War Ascension only having one type of unlockable, and it's just as unoriginal as the rest of the game. You'll unlock a set of costumes simply by beating the campaign. The problem is that most of these armor sets look way too similar to each other. It's just a bunch of helmets and shoulder pads and ugly. This could have been the one spot where Ascension made a name for itself. How about some silly ass costumes based on the four different combat elements? We could have had Reaper Kratos or Santa Kratos. Dress the man like a clown. Anything to help this game stand out would have been great. With the way things have been going with this game, it should come as no surprise. There are no completion bonuses for anything else. Nothing for New Game Plus, nothing for the Platinum Trophy, nothing for Titan Mode, and nothing for the multiplayer either. It's a travesty. I'm not disappointed because of all the work and time I put into this game. And make no mistake, it was a lot of work and time. I'm disappointed because Ascension failed to stand out, even during the moments where it was painfully easy to do so. While I completed God of War Ascension, there were 47 deaths, 7 costumes earned, 10 artifacts collected, 36 trophies unlocked, 28 prestiges achieved in multiplayer, 120 hours of total playtime, and only five years between this game's release and the release of the new God of War. What a difference five years can make. Despite my constantly mentioning it, I tried really hard not to compare the new God of War to Ascension. But while I played it, the new one kept creeping up into my mind. I don't think it's fair to compare the two, but it's bound to happen. We're living in a world where we've witnessed firsthand what the God of War series has the potential to be. And ultimately, that makes Ascension seem a lot more flawed and uninspired. Maybe if I had completed it before this year, I would have found God of War Ascension slightly more more remarkable, but I guess I'll never know. As for now, it's a game that's probably best left in the past. After sinking a lot of time into God of War Ascension, I'm a little disappointed. And it's hard, right, because I tried my best to not talk about the new God of War reboot, and it's hard that that influenced a lot of my opinions on today, but 
The reason why it did is because everything that came before Ascension was relatively simple, engaging, over the top, and the same. God of War Ascension feels like God of War 3.5, if you will. And I think that it was a stopgap game because the God of War 3 engine was so expensive, they needed another title. That's how it comes off to me. I will say the most unique thing about God of War Ascension is its multiplayer mode. And at one point or another, this mode, this whole setting of the online atmosphere was really fascinating and very, very fun. Today, unfortunately, it has not aged well and you can't even get a game going because of the services that no one's playing this game. That's a true thing that happens in today's day and age. If no one is playing the game over the course of several years and it doesn't have that fan base, then the game itself is going to die. And unfortunately, God of War Ascension is the kind of game that the multiplayer seemed like an afterthought, even though it probably wasn't. It just comes off that way. A lot of games at the time during that era did feel that way. So with all the stuff kind of out in the open, what you guys just watched in this video, let me be clear, I had fun with God of War Ascension. The multiplayer could be fun. It's just a bit repetitive, both from God of War standards and from a multiplayer standard. So with that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of play it. God of War copy provided by Sony. Views and opinions are of my own. Hashtag Sony partnership. Hashtag free product. When the God of War franchise first came into popularity 13 years ago, it was a game changer. The series told an epic tale of loss and revenge with an absolutely unmatched sense of scale and super tight yet super violent gameplay. However, like any long running series, it has had its ups and downs. And by the time God of War Ascension had come out, players were feeling that maybe the series had run out of ideas and had nothing new to say. Fortunately, the latest God of War completely upends that idea. With a new and unique Nordic fantasy setting, fantastic new gameplay ideas, and a deeply affecting story, God of War revitalizes and reboots the franchise while still being a direct sequel. Discover how the series pays tribute to its past while also looking forward to the future, and see how the ghost of Sparta makes dad bods look good when I complete the new God of War. Hey everyone, and welcome back to a very special episode of The Completionist. God of War is here, and you can bet your butt that I completed it, but before we get to that video, I wanted to give you guys a special opportunity to win a free copy of God of War. We're giving away two copies, one digital for the PS4, and one physical of the Collector's Edition. If you want to sign up for free, give it a click or tap in that description down below, and enjoy God of War on me. My passion for God of War was born right here on the show back in 2012, when I completed the very first one, and since then, we've done almost every single God of War since. So today, I am proud to announce that we are going to tackle the new one. God of War begins right now. Yes! Right. E3 2016. I was in the audience for Sony's presentation when a goddamn choir came out of nowhere singing, chanting, surrounding the audience. I turned to my friend Jesse Cox and I was saying in his ear quietly and passionately, God of War, God of War, God of War, God of War. And as the curtain rose, I realized that I was right. A new God of War game was being announced and that hype got f real for me right then and there. I realized that in that moment, God of War is going to become a mature game with insane visuals and maybe and hopefully a story that's going to make me care about our anti-hero and possibly this boy. Now, I've been making jokes ever since about Dad of War, but I didn't realize how deep this went. Corey Barlog, the game's creative director, who's just a tiny typo away from being an awesome flame demon, had a child himself 
and his perspective shifted. He now wanted to make a game where Kratos gets his chance to do things over again. What if Kratos got a chance to do things differently, better, right the mistakes of his past with a new family? This is a game that explores and reinforces that theme again and again with incredible results. After 2013's Ascension, I wondered if we'd ever see another God of War. I can see how sequel fatigue had set in for some players. People were tired of quick time events and endless rage. While the combo system and awesome new weapons of the God of War sequels and prequels were very fun to play with, some players were starting to see Kratos as a one-note character who just needed a break. It was time to take Kratos out of Greece and in a whole new direction. The new God of War is a totally different experience from previous entries. It's massive when compared to the older games, with realm after realm to explore. The combat system has been totally revamped, moving away from a more combo-based system to an RPG gear-style-based system that is extremely strategic. This series has grown up. I've been thinking about this game non-stop since I got it, and I'm just so freaking stoked to share it with you guys. I haven't been this excited about a new game in months, despite the fact that it might be the toughest God of War game that I've ever completed. No, to fully complete this game, I'll be playing through the main campaign at least twice. Once on Give Me a Challenge mode, which is exactly what it sounds like, and once more on Give Me God of War mode, which is where the game starts breaking its own rules just to break players' spirits. Because how else can I claim God status? Now what this game doesn't know is that in terms of completing them, I have crushed God of War games like Kratos crushes chests. You are not ready. Don't talk down to me, Kratos. I've mastered all of your games. I will also need to unlock all of Kratos and Atreus' new abilities. Since I'm diving right into the second hardest difficulty on my very first playthrough, I know it'll be a tough road ahead. But I'm hoping that my experiences with the other God of War games will help me out here. I'm confident that I can earn enough experience points through just playing the game to accomplish this task. Daddy doesn't like to show off but Kratos has got some new moves to strut. Additionally, there's a tab in the menu detailing different labors for Kratos to complete on his journey. Some of them are obvious and will be executed in normal gameplay. Kill 100 Draugr, use the Executioner's Cleave 100 times. Others will require a little extra finesse on my part, like using specific combos to take down enemies or hunting down rare trolls. You might even notice there's a troll toll. You gotta pay the troll toll. If you wanna get into that boy's hole, you gotta pay the Troll doll to get in. Stay away, troll. You're not going to get my boy's soul. Then there are the favors, which are basically side quests for Kratos and his son Atreus to complete. These range from helping trapped spirits find peace in this realm to freeing the prisoners of a mad dwarf king. I'll need to complete each and every one of them if I want to understand all of the lore and explore the entire map. Kratos has finally learned how to interact with people normally, instead of just slicing off their faces. Probably the end result of 20 years of anger management. So what better way to put that to use than by helping the people of the world solve their problems? Lastly, and hardest of all, there are some endgame bosses called the Valkyries that must be defeated if I am to truly complete this game. They're supposed to be the absolute hardest fights and should only be attempted after I've collected all of the best gear and then perfected using Kratos' abilities. Honestly, I'm a little nervous about coming up against these badasses. I'm sure with some Pilates and a few kale smoothies, Kratos and I can shake off the dust and emerge victorious. But I've still got my eye on you, DeVito troll. Back, I say, back! The new God of War is a massive departure from the series' roots in every conceivable way, and somehow all of these changes miraculously end up improving upon and redefining what God of War is, from the awe-inspiring visuals to the simple and yet subtly emotional story. This game is easily the most impressive God of War ever, and that's coming from someone who's completed almost every single one. Because this game blurs the line between sequel and reboot, players unfamiliar with Kratos' long history can jump right in without having to know too much. Kratos is a widower, and now he has a kid, Atreus, and a f 
epic beard that does not have a name. That goatee from the past? Gone, and replaced with this mighty masterpiece of a beard. He seems to be a changed man, living out his days much more isolated and much less rage fueled. After a short excursion where Kratos and Atreus go hunting, Kratos is menaced by the stranger, a man who knocks at his cabin door and starts trying to start some sh Kratos goes, hey, listen, you don't want none of this, let's just take it easy, let's relax. When all of a sudden things get super real, and Kratos realizes that his quiet life of solitude will never be the same again. Must have been what the Charlie bit my finger kid felt like the next day at preschool. His wife's tragic death and their now compromised seclusion set Kratos and his son on a quest to scatter Kratos' wife's ashes from the highest mountain in the realm. From there, the adventure expands and Kratos and Atreus traverse all kinds of different areas in the biggest God of War yet. From the opening scene, the tone is strikingly different from previous God of War games. Things are somber and weighty. Sony Santa Monica said that they were interested in taking Kratos into a new direction, and they totally delivered. Instead of being an engine of destruction hell-bent on revenge, Kratos exudes pathos. He has that thousand-yard stare with eyes that have just seen too much. The way Kratos looks at his son whenever Atreus asks about his past is basically the look I give Frazier whenever he tells me that the delivery guy forgot my burrito. There's even a different voice actor for Kratos, Christopher Judge, who replaced series veteran TC Carson. I'm going to cut off your head now. His performance brings a whole new side of Kratos into light. Instead of an all-caps performance brimming with primal rage and defiance, this Kratos has layers, like an onion, or an ogre, or a cake. This Kratos is sympathetic, saying so much with a simple, you do not understand, boy, or even a restrained, leave. Now, when Kratos tells Atreus not to trust the gods and how much they damage everything and everyone around them, you feel for him because you know that he's talking about himself. This Kratos doesn't need to shout to be heard, and that's due to deeply rooted performances and a stellar script. The God of War franchise has been around for so long that I honestly forgot how innovative the series is at its best. In this God of War, the environment work is totally unique, yet it still feels like something that fits in the God of War canon. Kratos and his son explore dwarven mines, elven sanctuaries, and even climb up the body of a giant the size of a city. Some men take up cycling or buy a Porsche during a midlife crisis, but Kratos has decided he'd rather take up what he calls extreme mountaineering. I have been over every inch of ancient Greece and brutally murdered everything I encountered, but being in stunning new environments, brimming with ancient mysteries waiting to be solved, had me floored. Each new location is more stunning than the last, and I don't just mean graphically, I mean imaginatively too. Although, playing on a PS4 Pro on a 4K TV didn't hurt the visuals either. There are visuals in this game that made my eyes pop and jaw drop. Fairy tale images that lingered long after I turned off the game, and a really well-defined take on Norse mythology. God of War games have always had amazing soundtracks that get the player into a very specific murdery headspace. Sony went with Bear McCreary to compose, and damn if he didn't deliver. The music is haunting, catchy, and epic all at once. There's an amazing choir element that recurs throughout that sends shivers through my beard, and something else rare shows up in the soundtrack. Silence. There are times where the music fades away almost entirely to emphasize a character moment. At least until some giant troll crashes through the trees and the music kicks back in like Kramer kicking the door down. <laughs> The game introduces a ton of new systems for players to learn. The menu UI is a little dense, but it gets the job done. Each tab of the menu focuses on a different feature, like the skill tree or Kratos' armor setup. It's complex, but if you've played any sort of RPG, it's nothing unfamiliar. Even for players who aren't used to role-playing elements, the game does a good job layering those elements in and getting players used to navigating the menu. And people say that dads can't handle new technology. Kratos can read the instructions, damn it! In my first playthrough of the game on the regular old PS4, I had a few frame rate dips and drops here and there. But once I switched over to a PS4 Pro and optimized performance settings, I never encountered anything jaggy or distracting. No issues at all. And there's always something happening in this game, from flickering torchlights to a mountain-sized snake writhing over the hills in the background. I'm not saying that Sony would purposefully optimize this game for the PS4 Pro at the expense of the PS4, but 
Well, no, let's be real, that's probably what's happening here. What this game does technologically is obviously impressive, but what really became clear to me the more I played it was the beating heart at the center of it all. No bullshit. God of War reminded me about why I love video games. It tells a truly heartfelt and personal father-son story. You can tell that Cory Barlog wore his heart on his sleeve throughout the making of this game, and that passion and love is reflected in all the stellar attention to detail. Even the gory brutality is lovingly rendered, and the violence serves a purpose. If I had to sum up God of War in one word, it would be human. I'll let that irony sink in for just one moment, but really, I mean it. Seriously, everything in this game has a setup and a payoff. It's just so incredibly holistic and well-rounded. The presentation, narrative, and tone in God of War are all the next level. And fortunately, the combat and exploration are top-notch as well. The combat has been totally retooled to fit in within the narrative and camera work. The game puts its own spin on exploration, taking elements from other contemporary games and binding them to its own unique DNA. Not trying to bring weird science into this fantasy setting, but God of War is like the Indominus Rex of video games. In previous God of War titles, Kratos hacked and slashed his way through huge levels, wrecked any minotaur, skeletons, and gorgons in his path, stopped for some light puzzle solving, then fought mind-bogglingly huge bosses. In Dad of War, Kratos and Atreus explore many of the realms of Midgar, with Kratos reluctantly teaching his son the ways of war. There's still plenty of hacking, slashing, and exploration, but deep RPG elements have been folded in, and kitting your gear out is a must to fully complete this game. Kratos basically stopped by the Norse version of Men's Warehouse, and you know what? He likes the way he looks. The other side of the hacks over coin from the combat is the exploration. The overworld is huge, even if it isn't really true open world. Many locations are locked out until the end game, but all of them are worth exploring to the full. And some locations are essential to visit if you want some top level gear. The dungeon areas in the game have their fair share of puzzles to solve. Most of them are fairly simple. A locked door is unlocked by pulling a specific lever, but that lever must be held by Kratos until his son can dash through the door, or a passageway is filled with brambles that can't be destroyed until a specific tool is acquired. Nothing we haven't seen before in a Zelda game or earlier God of War titles. Puzzles break up the combat, but do not kill momentum completely. Ultimately though, he's not the god of tea parties or the god of calmly listening to NPR. Kratos is a former Spartan, so he's basically the Meryl Streep of dismemberment. Fortunately, the combat in this game is fun and exhilarating. The first God of War games were extremely combo heavy, requiring players to memorize their string of button presses to maximize their effectiveness in combat. This God of War takes a page from Bloodborne or Dark Souls, forcing the player to focus on strategy over straight savagery. There is locked and unlocked combat, and individual enemies have power levels and health bars. Instead of blunt forcing my way through a fight, I had to optimize my gear and learn which runic ability and talismans would give me an edge. There are now six stats that players must keep track of, and if you're new to the franchise or RPG elements in general, it's probably best to focus on gear that increases strength, defense, and vitality. But I did my best to max out on strength, defense, runic, and luck. You might say I kept Kratos up all night to get lucky. Now these new stats are also influenced by the gear that Kratos acquires. There are several different types of armor, and Kratos' level is influenced by what you have equipped. Armor sets can be upgraded, and special enchantments can be slotted in to vastly increase combat effectiveness. It's honestly really fun to figure out what armor sets work best for your playstyle as you move throughout the game, and it marks the first time players can outfit Kratos however they like. It's mixing and matching the accessories that came with different G.I. Joes. Let's give Storm Shadow a freaking bazooka. Why the hell not? The way to upgrade gear is to visit one of the two dwarf brothers, Brock or Sindri. They're two of the most memorable characters in the game, and some of the most mechanically helpful as well. You can't upgrade the axe or Atreus' bow without them. And they have this great sibling rivalry thing going on, where if one brother makes an upgrade, the other brother feels compelled to top him. 
One ingenious new addition is the way Atreus behaves during enemy encounters. I don't know if he heard that the best sidekick NPC awards were coming, but he might beat out Ellie from The Last of Us or Bioshock Infinite Elizabeth in terms of combat effectiveness, healing items, and banter. Atreus freaking rules, even if he does not understand and he is not ready. Functionally, Atreus acts as a support system to Kratos. He can fire arrows to distract and kill regular enemies, or attract the attention of larger ones. He eventually gains some magical abilities like shock arrows and magical summons. Summoning a wolf to attack a terrified troll is weirdly satisfying and sort of hilarious. And getting a horde of mystical wild boars to trip and trample a group of enemies is just as good. Atreus will even run into the fray himself and start choking out individuals with his bow. He's fearless, he's sassy, and he's got plot armor. The perfect combination. One of the wisest choices the developers made made in the new God of War was making Kratos proficient with a totally new and different weapon, the Leviathan Axe. The Leviathan Axe is a strong contender for best new video game weapon, which is the next award they present after best sidekick NPC. It's a puzzle solving tool that can also cleave Draugr in two. It is simultaneously Kratos' main projectile and his light and heavy weapon. It has magical properties, it can freeze enemies. The thing even boomerangs back into Kratos' hand like a certain magical hammer that you've heard of. In other God of War games, it was difficult and sometimes unfun for players to experiment with new weapons because the Blades of Chaos were so freaking awesome. But the axe is like Jeff Goldblum. It improves everything it's involved in and gets lodged into your head unexpectedly. <laughs> <laughs> Kratos also has apparently lugged a punching bag with him and put it in the man cave because his unarmed combat skills are banana pants insane. Enemies now have a stun meter below their health bar and unarmed punches and kicks from Kratos fill up that meter very quickly. When it's completely full, Kratos can f*** their sh right up with a finishing move, triggered by getting close to the enemy and smashing R3 like it's the like button on this video. Most low-level enemies are completely ripped apart by these moves, and they're always super satisfying to pull off. Kratos also has a shield strapped to his left arm, complete with its own skill tree. Mastering, blocking, and parrying is absolutely required at higher difficulties. It's a welcomed addition that fleshes out his moveset. Spartan Rage makes a triumphant return too, and you know what? Even that has a skill tree. It's like Oprah dropped by and said, you get a skill tree, you get a skill tree, everybody gets a skill tree in God of War. After filling up the rage meter by dealing damage, Kratos can tap into his rage and basically turn into a superhero. He zooms across the field of battle and can rip boulders right out of the earth, decimating anything in his path. It's empowering and super fun to use. And the game isn't stingy about letting the player get a little bit of that aggression out either. Anger management was good and all, but sometimes Kratos needs to let his fists do the talking. Now, some stuff that happens in the latter half of the game completely changes the way you play. And I really feel like not talking about it actually hurts any coverage of this game. So, at this point in time, this is your last chance to avoid some spoilers. Ready? Here we go. You cannot change. You will always be a monster. I know, but I am your monster no longer. That's right, kids. The Blades of Chaos, Kratos' signature weapons from every other God of War game before this, makes a dramatic return. The Blades are speedy and devastating weapons, great for mob control and inflicting tons of burn damage. All the best moves from the old games return, from the room-clearing spins to the fiery plumes that launch enemies into the air. Kratos can even impale individuals on the end of the chain, scorpion-style, and bringing them forward, screaming, GET OVER HERE! Alright, I made up that get over here stuff, but I said it out loud when it happened. The weapons come at a perfect time in the game, probably about halfway through the main plot line. Just enough time for the player to have gotten a real handle on the axe and unarmed combat. But they might be starting to have a few thousand extra experience points burning a hole in the menu tab. Because of course, the Blades of Chaos themselves have their own skill tree. Narratively, Kratos returning home to get the blades serves a purpose as well. He gave up using them when he first moved to Midgard, but kept them as a reminder to 
to never let himself be manipulated and chained to the will of the gods. By using them of his own free will for a noble purpose, he's proving to himself that he is in control and not some mindless rage monster. It's a great moment and all the more impactful if you're a fan of the series. I'd like to call it an oh shit moment. The entire time leading up to this, I couldn't stop myself from grinning and laughing maniacally. This is what I also meant when I say that the game makes setups and has payoffs. It's a Chekhov's gun scenario. When Kratos casually wraps his arm guards in the very opening scene of the game, it's setting the player up to pay attention. The information is right there in the beginning, and the payoff is mwah, sublime. I told one of the writers on this team that one of my secret hopes is that the Blades would make a return, and when they did, we both shared an oh sh moment. As for the bosses in this game, they're fairly unique, with the exception of the totem pole carrying trolls, who are sort of like different colored mini bosses in any given area. The big bosses at the end of a level require a mix of pattern recognition, puzzle solving skills, and combat prowess to overcome. Some are merely Kratos sized, and some are screen filling monstrosities, but they're all varied and fun to match up against. One more big change? The camera work. Something God of War games have always handled really well is scale. Kratos would be fighting the Colossus of Rhodes or climbing up the side of a Titan, and the camera would pull back to show just how small Kratos was in comparison to the odds he was facing. That made the player feel like an enormous badass by making each victory feel like scaling a mountain or truly overcoming impossible odds. In God of War 2018, things get a little more intimate. Instead of pulling back and giving the player a view of the whole room, the camera is locked over Kratos' shoulder. The man takes up probably an entire fifth of the screen. This makes the action feel even more intense and brutal, yet still very cinematic. It's almost like the entire game is that incredible single shot scene from Children of Men. I'm honestly not somebody who gets really jazzed about cinematography stuff, but this game made me appreciate it so much. The camera work helped the story and the gameplay in equal parts. While the user interface is pretty pretty logical overall, the one thing I didn't love was the map. It looks pretty, a top-down view of an old, timey mythological map, but in practice, it's pretty unhelpful for orienting. It's essentially a giant checklist for collectibles. It looks cool, like a neat diorama, but it doesn't really tell you where you are or where you're going. I just chalk it up to Kratos really stepping into the role of a dad and never asking for directions. What ended up being extremely helpful during exploration portions and for finding collectibles and loot was the witch's compass, because basically I learned quickly that if I was at a fork in the road and the compass told me to go west, I almost certainly found treasure if I headed east. You can turn the compass off in the HUD if you want a more immersive experience, but it's essential for helping find all the precious goodies throughout the land. Lord knows I need my goodies. Completing this game on Give Me a Challenge and then again on Give Me God of War honestly made me enjoy the game so much more than if I had played on an easier difficult setting. Yes, the first several hours are excruciatingly painful because Kratos doesn't have any good gear or skills to mess up the competition, but like a fine Russian massage, you get used to the pain after a while. There was a period of a couple days where I really felt like I wouldn't be able to make it through the game on the hardest difficulty, especially since once you start Give Me God of War mode, you're locked into that mode and cannot bring the difficulty down ever again. And I really did not expect enemies to level up in the middle of a battle to make my life even that much harder, but one day? Things just clicked into focus. I was like Neo, seeing the patterns and becoming the true god of war. Buying all of Kratos' and Atreus' skills is not only entirely possible in a single playthrough, it's critical. Some of the skills are absolutely game-changing, like mastering the parry maneuver or getting Atreus' lightning arrows to chain to multiple enemies. Buying all the upgrades in every skill tree wasn't as tough as it might seem since the game hands out experience points like Leo hands out lewds in Wolf of Wall Street. Similarly, I did didn't have to go too far out of my way to complete Kratos' different labors. Just as I predicted, most of them I completed just by playing the game, though there were a few specific enemies I had to hunt down and defeat, like the supremely tough travelers. Like what is this Dark Souls looking mother doing in my dimension? I was not expecting PvP. Hold on, let me just get my build set up properly first, then we're good to go. But the favors led to some of the best parts of the game. Every side quest feels loaded with meaning, and all of them are thematically relevant to the main plot. A lot of the lore that's discovered you don't even realize ties to the main themes of the game until later on. But looking back, it 
all resonates beautifully. Fathers and sons, betrayal, distrust, redemption. Favors are where so much comes together. And the rewards for finishing the favors aren't bad either, ranging from incredibly decked out gear to heaps of hack silver and experience points. I don't want to jinx anything for future games, but I feel like video game side quests lately have become amazing. Once I purchased all the skills possible and used the rewards from completing labors and favors to upgrade my gear, it was time to face the eight corrupted Valkyrie warriors locked away in hidden locations. This nearly broke me. Unlike any other fight in the game, each Valkyrie has a unique pattern to test Kratos' metal, but fighting them is the absolute most single badass thing to do in God of War. It feels like a final exam where if you don't get an A+, you get served a screeching death. Once again, I have to emphasize, I'm extremely impressed with how these endgame fights tie into the overall narrative. All in all, moving through the world of God of War is interesting and fun, cribbing from Zelda and a little bit of Dark Souls to create its own unique blend of exploration, loot finding, and bone crunching fighting. The combat is tight and viscerally satisfying, with a ton of elements that make it feel unique. The systems feel deeper than the Lake of Nine, and mastering them will make you feel like a deity. Each gameplay element feels handcrafted to deliver a memorable experience. Trust me, the beard in this game will not steer you wrong. God of War takes a unique approach to post-game content. Rather than unlocking challenge modes that appear in the main menu after you go through the story, the post-game is all there in the main world. The player can choose to continue exploring and having a sprawling adventure, or they can just choose to be done after fulfilling Kratos' wife's final wish. Maybe head back to his cabin for a nap. You just know that Kratos has a secret easy chair to settle into. While there aren't any unlockable costumes or new game plus mode type content, the 365 collectibles, the nine devilishly difficult Valkyrie fights, and two challenging secret realms kept me busy for hours. There is so much lore, they would be insane to dump it all on a player in the main plot. So many great nuggets are hidden in the side content. Helping Atreus fill out his mother's journal by finding and decoding runes is heartwarming and leads to a deeper understanding of the Norse gods. Guess what? They're generally just as selfish and as cruel as the Greek gods. I I'm shocked. Shocked, I tell you. Now, as the days go on and more and more people are playing God of War, they're finding secrets and fun little side quests. And more specifically, the one that I really enjoy is the one regarding the Collector's Edition map. There is a map here within this map that showcases where Brock and Sindri went on their travels and journeys. And within that, you can actually find a secret item. God of War is also filled with Easter eggs about Infinity War, the new Avengers film. So there are a lot of fun things within the realm of God of War that are recent and from the classic games of old. With regards to the map that comes with the God of War Collector's Edition, this secret was found out from the community online. On the map, there's actually a message written in runes. This message translates to a location in which Sindri and Brock travel to. It turns out it's on one of the gateways to one of the different realms. All you have to do is walk in the center of it and tilt the camera in a particular order. Each camera angle is pointing to the location in which the boys have traveled to. Once done correctly, you will get the secret item. Now, I wish I knew about this early on because it would have been very useful in the early playthrough. However, this item instantly is obsolete. Now, with regards to the Infinity Gauntlet Easter Egg, this one is a bit more obscure. Upon completing one of the favors, you will get this item called the Shattered Gauntlet of Ages. This is one of the few talismans in the game that can be fully upgraded to the benefit of Kratos. It also is one of the few talismans that comes with sockets. Once you've maxed it out, you can put three sockets in it. There are actually six different enchantment stones that you can put in the gauntlet. The Asgard Shard of Existence, for example, acts as the Reality Stone, whereas Ivaldi's Corrupted Mind is the Mind Stone. The use of the Shattered Gauntlet lets you kind of do this cool slowdown time punch that has a slight AoE ripple effect. However, if you equip three of the enchantments that line up with the Infinity Stones, you will launch projectiles out of the gauntlet. 
pretty freaking cool stuff. The two end game realms, Niflheim and Musefelheim, are unlocked by finding special ciphers that Atreus can use. The realms are challenging areas that allow you to get amazing gear and are also home to a Valkyrie fight each. These were definitely some of the more difficult zones for me to conquer, especially Niflheim. It's a maze completely filled with mist that drains Kratos' health, and the enemy layout and boss layouts are all random every single time, making it difficult to navigate and farm for the materials that you need. A little poison mist ain't gonna stop me. I need the best gear in this game so I can impress the other dads at soccer practice, and they're all available right here in Niflheim. You may be confused, as earlier I said, eight Valkyrie fights, then nine Valkyrie fights. The reality is, is that once you kill the eight Valkyries, you must bring their helmets to the Valkyrie Council. After you put their helmets on each of their thrones, you then have awoken the Valkyrie Queen. The Valkyrie Queen is the secret final boss of the game. The Valkyrie Queen is basically all the Valkyries combined into one evil badass being. All the moves from before are all right here. Single-handedly, this boss took me five and a half hours to conquer. I was going insane as I was playing this fight, but I was so focused. I was in there. I was getting stronger, and by the time I conquered her, I felt like a god! Chicken! Barbecue sauce! Give me those wings! Oh! All you can eat! Give it to me! Yes! And while it felt amazing to get that platinum on Give Me God of War mode, and theoretically ending my playthrough, all the rewards I got ended up not being worth it because I was done. After all the crap I've been through, the Valkyrie fights were the best way that I could end my ultimate run. Finishing Give Me God of War mode unlocks a couple of awesome shield skins and the intrinsic satisfaction of superiority that comes with mastery over a game like this. Interestingly, there's no trophy challenge associated with difficulty for this game. You can get a platinum trophy by doing everything else on an easier difficulty setting, which is fascinating because every other God of War game has a ultimate hard mode trophy. But the satisfaction of besting the worst that the game devs could throw throw at me? Truly priceless. I'm like the Zen master of bladed murder. I will protect my boy. No one will stop me from protecting my boy! While I completed God of War, there were 99 and a half hours of total playtime. 365 different collectibles collected, which include things such as objectives, treasures and their maps, ravens, portals, and all kinds of chests. Nine Valkyries bopped to all hell, two full campaign playthroughs, one of which was Give Me God of War mode, five times where Kratos pulled his arm back dramatically from Atreus, and one oh sh MCU style scene that got me pumped for any future of the God of War franchise. God of War 2018 defines what God of War is now, and in my opinion, this is the best God of War yet. The difficulty can be a lot to contend with, especially with its overwhelming amount of collectibles, but the lore, great storytelling, and refined combat is more than deserving of the legacy of God of War. God of War, or God of Fourth, God of War 4, is the best God of War to date, hands down. I love the Leviathan Axe. I love the throwbacks to the original games. I love this story. I love the fact that we care about Kratos and Atreus, and we go on this very large smoking gun journey that is very, very aware of what's going on at any given moment. If the rumors are true, and we've got four or five more God of War games coming, and they're a lot like this, and they go forward and innovate, then I am all for it. It. In regards to completing the game, Give Me God of War mode is one of the most difficult challenges that I have overcome. But here is the thing as I got better at this game, I realized what the point of Give Me God of War is. Give Me God of War mode is meant to make you feel like a god. In regards to that, Santa Monica Studios, you did just that. So, with that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of complete it. Complete it.
Gut.